The organization is uh, effectively a voluntary organization, and uh, it's uh, it's represented by uh, by experts and uh, academics, uh, clinicians, uh, but also some some patients organization. So um, we need, of course, partnerships uh, to grow stronger. And uh, today, I'm I'm very happy that that Nikki uh, Schultek, she's uh, leading uh, this uh, this focus group on uh, infectious uh, driven um, dementia or, or neurological uh, disease. And uh, um, I think she, she, she's, she's clearly someone who, who has, has endorsed this, this mission. And uh, um, I want to, of course, thank her for, for finding a lot of uh, today's uh, speakers and really um, inspiring uh, this, uh, this symposium. So why is it important to partner with, with groups uh, like uh, uh, Interstellar Research Group is really to spark discussion. And I think we will have at least uh, two, uh, two or three talks about um, the uh, infectious hypothesis of AD, which uh, after COVID uh, seems now real. Uh, it, was, it was real before, according to the data. But of course, there is uh, much more evidence now uh, due to the uh, prevalence of, of this disease that we had in the past uh, three years. Um, so, and why we need this coalition, of course, uh, Switzerland is no exception. Uh, we have even uh, here about 150,000 uh, patients who are diagnosed. Uh, and this is just going to grow because, uh, of course, life expectancy here uh, is also uh, increasing. Actually, we we uh, typically Swiss uh, the, the Swiss population is very healthy, uh, very very high hygiene. So uh, this is not going to going to change. As, and, and Switzerland is no exception in, in this to the rules. So. Um, and what is clear is that, of course, uh, as it happens for other parts of the world, uh, women are more affected than uh, than than men, uh, and um, but they're also more involved in the caring. Um, and the, those numbers, as we know, it's just an underestimation because about half of the cases actually are undiagnosed. In particular, in Switzerland, it's very difficult to um, to speak out because uh, those patients uh, typically uh, don't have the means to to reach uh, to the public. Um, and as, and there is a lot of uh, stigma on on the fact to have a a, a relative who's affected by uh, by dementia. So um, what do we have to do is really follow a little bit what happens in the in the U.S. And by we, no means we want to follow the 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 the, the step, but we certainly have a lead in the Alzheimer uh, impact movement. Uh, which raised uh, the spending for, for dementia research to 3.5 billion. Uh, this is clearly a, a big objective, and, a, and I think in this, in this sense, the U.S. is, is very forward-thinking, think, and NIH is, is really putting a lot of energy in this to, to find cures, because um, at some point it's better to have a treatable condition uh, rather than having a lot of spending go into indirect cost uh, affecting not only the patients, but all the family and also the caregiver. Where are we in, in Switzerland? Where we are in, in not a very good condition, we, we do have uh, about uh, um, 10 million spent uh, per year uh, by the, the, the Swiss National Fund uh, in, in dementia research. And we are about a 0.08% of the GDP spending, which is dedicated to this field. So this is li literally dismal in proportion to other countries. And this is why uh, organizations like ours are so important. Uh, and, uh, and we need really to, to, to never give up. And even if this year, uh, the program of the, um, of, of, of proposing to the, to the, to the government, uh, um, uh, project on, on on dementia research was unaccepted. I think uh, it's never too late to get this uh, again to to the politician and make uh, our voice heard. And what better um, way to make it heard is really through facts. And so, um, how do we make this difference? Of course, we we have a, a, we are as researcher. I think we can really uh, provide evidence. 
And then uh, from for civil society, we have the, the patients, their family, uh, and the advocacy group that support us and the politician to get really to this 1% of GDP spending dedicated to this field. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm going backwards, I don't know why. So um, we are responding to the need in this sense, and this is really was our hope to uh, democratize brain science. Uh, there is a lot about uh, health, healthy living, uh, healthy body, but uh, much less is known about uh, the brain. The brain seems to, still to be kind of a black box. And I think again, uh, even if COVID has been terrible, uh, just now we are uh, hearing about um, memory loss in, in early uh, uh, in early um, in, in young individuals through COVID, uh, through this uh, post viral syndrome, which we actually were knowing before from other uh, viral infection or bacterial infection, but now we really have the brain is kind of uh, not any more of a black box, but uh, it's an important part of, of our body, and we need to take attention. And we need to talk about more about the brain, not only uh, not only in scientific terms, but really disseminate the concept of uh, uh, of, of of brain health to uh, to the public. And we need to talk about this uh, more with our family, friends, uh, and also students. And of course, um, we of course in Switzerland we have an enormous uh, innovation potential. It's this is one of the most innovative country in the world. So it would make sense to have uh, a program here. And uh, uh, we would like, of course, to translate the findings very, very rapidly uh, from the, the bench uh, to, to the bed. But we know this is particularly difficult for this disease, which is, which is a very uh, long asymptomatic phase. And the only way we can really uh, do it is to through grow in this community. And it's an international community. We cannot by no means um, no means uh, le let alone uh, Switzerland, but we need to really to get uh, inspiration uh, and join the conversation with the international organization and international experts. Sorry, I'm doing something wrong. It's <laughs> not allowing me. So session one, um, we I um, I really wanted to I, I uh, designed this this uh, this symposium uh, together with with Nikki um, and also the other leader of, of the organization, and we first start uh, looking at the mechanism, and then once we have identified mechanism, uh, we 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 go into the therapeutics. This is something that uh, takes a lot of time. Um, I think that the, this disease is particularly difficult because, of course, uh, the brain is, is difficult to reach, uh, very difficult to access. But we have um, drug druggable uh, mechanism of action, and uh, uh, of course, we need to to look at the evolution of this disease and uh, uh, try to go as early as possible uh, in this continuum, um, this the path pathophysiological continuum, and try and really to uh, to to investigate uh, those peripheral markers that are reflecting brain health and. Uh, of course, we all know that uh, cognitive testing, uh, just by looking at the uh, at the, the evolution of, of the disease, uh, is is very very uh, late a uh, late marker, and we need uh, very very quickly uh, to develop early biomarker in peripheral uh, biofluids. And uh, I think that the uh, the effort from uh, from the Zetterberg group uh, in finding blood biomarker is very promising. But it's not. I think it's not enough. We don't. We are not uh, early enough in order to uh, identify strata that are at risk. So uh, I think there is much more work to be done first on to the biomarker, and also those biomarker could be uh, druggable targets. Uh, we also know the structural changes are very late. Um, uh, we also know that this uh, uh, field is quite classical. And of course, uh, uh, neurologists, uh, they need to, to see uh, structural changes in order to be able to assess that there is an atrophy. But those ap happen very, very late on. So if there is any uh, more specific uh, methodology, we know that PIP-PET 
uh, is is used uh, quite extensively. It's it's extremely expensive, and and gives just a um, a readout of amyloid uh, aggregation. I think that anything that is early on that can can really distinguish and those early changes would be uh, very desirable. And of course, we have a new concept. So it's not only am amyloid tau. Uh, and neurodegeneration, but there is a new concept of inflammation. And I think inflammation is really uh, a keystone uh, mechanism that uh, should be addressed. And uh, this this really is a, is a propeller uh, of uh, a cascade that uh, cannot stop and probably uh, should be targeted uh, more um, extensively. So, um, of course, uh, we 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 know that um, inflammation is doesn't occur just just like that, and we we have some evidence that probably inflammation is not only uh, proper to to the brain, but there is peripheral inflammation that then can transfer into 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 central inflammation. And I think again, uh, I don't want this to be uh, too biased, but uh, infectious diseases, infectious agents can cause peripheral inflammation that then uh, propagates to the brain. And so this is very important also for the community looking at uh, first looking at COVID uh, and, and the effects of COVID, uh, neurological effects of COVID. So a multivariate disease, this is a, a recent uh, paper that uh, shows how many um, agents could be in the disease and the evolution of the disease. And if we could uh, map all those uh, biomarkers and and find that those biomarkers are really um, giving us a hint. We could uh, construct strata, and from strata we could do um, better in devising therapeutic strategies. And so, well, in, in just in the introduction, the speaker of session one, we have Professor Dr. Perry, uh, Professor Ryan Ballin, uh, Professor Q. Uh, she's going to come back, and Professor uh, Zhang. And uh, the first session will be moderated by uh, Nikki Schultek. And just uh, um, what, why we we have this session, and I think we will discuss this in the in the in the panel discussion. We have uh, mechanism of actions in in Alzheimer's disease are complex, and so not only because of the timeline, but we really need to to discuss more about those and and try to challenge those ideas that seems very far uh, from from us but they are uh, we can we can we can try to um, advance this field maybe also by by novel model uh, we know we have uh, several in vitro model that now uh, uh, kind of our surrogate of of, of uh, rodents and we can definitely need to to move on to to find uh, novel uh, novel druggable targets that um, evolve in the uh, in the disease progression. And I just want to say a little bit about the session too. Uh, I decided to to uh, to go into the therapeutics. Uh, this is a, of course, um, we need just in time agents uh, to really identify those agents that are determinant for uh, the this population at risk and prepare them uh, for therapeutics which are timely. For this particular strata, uh, and of course, this is like a, just a learning. We learn from a crisis because we see that the number of clinical trials have not increased. Of course, uh, there was a pandemic, and so they kind of recouped from the 2019. Uh, but uh, I think that from the uh, uh, list of antibodies against amyloid, uh, the only one that has uh, that has been basically is there. Their survivor is lecanamab that we heard from uh, last week, and yet uh, we think that there is a, a lot of uh, discussion on this, whether it's really effective or not. It is clear that amyloid is causative, but is it the right um, druggable target, uh, or is it the only target? This is, of course, uh, very questionable. And of course, the, the, the wheel looks brighter uh, because we have uh, many more uh, Many more agents that are uh, in the uh, in the development uh, amyloid uh, tau, uh, and of course we have uh, quite a bit of the neuroinflammation and uh, synaptic mechanism, 
and we will hear a little bit more about uh, the therapeutics and there is also digital therapeutics which is not uh, added to, to this uh, to this wheel so uh, of course prevention uh, is prevention is also very very important and there are, there are at least two uh global studies the pointers and the fingers uh, where uh lifestyle intervention are uh, implemented into the practice, into the routine, and trying really to uh, diminish uh, or, or delay the risk of the uh, dementia onset. And so we, we also heard that it's never too late to start um, those lifestyle interventions that are also subject with already um, an onset of dementia. They can improve through uh, those, those practices. And of course, then it was COVID, and so <laughs> antimicrobials might be the key uh, at some point. Uh, we will also hear in the last session about this, uh, how antimicrobial can make the, the difference. And uh, here are the speakers of the session two, Professor Yago Mincer, Jessica Francis Kovenko, and Professor Cheng Fegzong, and Mark Nelson. Um, and the moderator will be Emmanuel Lebray. So I would like just to give the word now to Professor Perry, uh, and I will just finish this uh, uh, in, in the uh, acknowledgement. So. Lavinia, thank you so much for the incredible overview and um, you know, really um, many of the points you make hit home. I know for everyone here today. Um, again, I'm so pleased to be joining everyone. Lavinia, thank you so much for partnering up and asking me to moderate this first session. Um, again, my name is Nikki Schultek. I'm the founder of a global research consortium called Intracell Research Group. I'm here with many of my colleagues today. Uh, we are actually focused on the relationship between microbial infection and uh, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and so Intracell's purpose is to essentially build research collaborations and bring people together that otherwise might not have the opportunity to work together uh, in order to really advance this idea, the concept that uh, every patient is not the same and that, as Lavinia pointed out, microbial drivers may be important for a subset and we would like to know who that is. Um, with that, it is a privilege and an honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. George Perry. Uh, George is at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, he has published thousands of peer-reviewed publications uh, in this space and uh, is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. And today, uh, George will be talking uh, about Alzheimer's disease and uh, about this tireless search for a cure. <laughs> George, with that, I'll turn, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Nikki, for the generous introduction and for being invited to this event, which I hope marks more activity on the Swiss uh, government and organizations to dealing with Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so I'm not going to talk that much about microbes, but I will mention some aspects that impinge on how we're trying to get more involved in studying microbes in Alzheimer's disease. Um, I collaborate with people throughout the world, uh, no one in Switzerland now, but several European countries, Asian countries. So where do we start with Alzheimer's disease? In some ways, in some ways we've advanced a lot. In some ways we're back at 1906 with Dr. Alzheimer or Dr. Fisher in the early 1900s describing a pathological conditions, neuropathology, plaques and tangles, and a dementing cognitive loss. And ever since then, there's been a focus. If we could get rid of these ugly things that have developed in the brain, we're bound to reverse things. And you've already heard that Alzheimer's disease is a major public health issue, so I won't go through that. But how, over all that 116 years, um, there have been hundreds of thousands of publications tens of thousands of investigators, and right now, billions of dollars spent on basic research as well as clinical trials. And yet, um, even if we include 
the recent vaccines as successes, we're looking at over a 99% failure to develop effective therapeutics. And is this because we've been focused too long on the initial observation of Alzheimer and Fisher of plaques and tangles driving the disease? Uh, as you heard earlier, the idea that amyloid actually is the primary driver. Well, the amyloid theory has been tested, and I'll go through why it, uh, why it may not be so simple, it is that amyloid beta has been removed from the brain, and there's been, well, there might have been a change in the slope of decline. None of the patients were improved by these kinds of treatments. And if we move from ta amyloid to tau, is this going to be anything different than before? Okay, so we've studied amyloid and tau, and, uh, but the main focus of our work for the last 30 years has been in oxidative stress as a way to look at the disease. Not saying that oxidative stress causes the disease, but that it is a, another way of looking at holding things together. And most people that are not in the field kind of go with the um, classic definition, and that is the production of reactive oxygen and excessive antioxidant mechanisms. Your body is, um, when you eat food, you're oxidizing that food in your mitochondria with copper and iron enzymes and eventually goes to water and uh, carbon dioxide. But at the same time that happens, there's side reactions catalyzed by iron and copper also that cause oxidative stress. But what's been happening over the last 20 plus years is an evolving definition. And this is why giving antioxidant vitamins, it's not as simple as lowering oxidative stress because oxidative stress plays a critical role in cell signaling. It also is met with um, increase antioxidant responses. And that's what is going to be relevant to what I present today. Okay, so what does oxidative stress look like? At least by the classic definition, you'd see increased oxidative damage, modification of molecules that normally wouldn't be modified by oxidation. And this is a tissue section of a hippocampus of the brain with many pyramidal neurons, these triangular shaped neurons. And it's stained with an antibody to 8-hydroxyguanosine. And in fact, what it turns out, most of this reactivity is to ribosomal RNA that's been oxidized. Now, there's several things to note here. One is that if a neuron happens to have a tangle in it, and that's what this little uh, white spot, because it's marked with tangle red and it's birefringent, they actually have less oxidative damage. And I'll talk more about that later, about how it relates to amyloid. So what we found in these studies was really surprising because all of the neurons of a certain population all show the same amount of oxidative damage. And that involves every type of oxidative damage, whether it's uh, nucleic acid oxidation, lipid peroxidation, protein oxidation, or sugar oxidation. They all occur, and they all occur before there's any obvious abnormality. There's no tau cha changes in most of these neurons. So we looked at what could be causing this type of oxidation changes. And the most likely underlying cause of this would be Fenton reaction. That is accumulation of iron and copper in unusual redox states, but not redox suppressed by protein binding. And this is kind of a summary of the type of reactions you find, because your primary oxidants like superoxide or even hydrogen peroxide is not that reactive with, um, with proteins or other compounds. What is really reactive is hydroxyl radical. And, that, and these are catalyzed by copper and iron. So we actually, look, uh, therefore, since so we've demonstrated a range of oxidative damage, we've been able to show that it's early in the course of the disease. Then we wanted to understand what is the mechanism for its production. So this is a way to look for um, redox activity of iron. And you can see between the control versus an Alzheimer's disease, the pathology as well as the cytoplasm has this type of change uh, of ability to um, change the redox state. And uh, it occurs again, very, very early in mild cognitive impairment incident cases. So 
based on this, these findings and some others I'll show later, we came up with this sort of a, an idea that what we're actually looking at is changes in mitochondria, which are present within in high density within the neuron, and their turnover and release of um, copper and iron in inappropriate locations. So we're not talking about an increase in iron and copper because there isn't much of a difference. What there is is a change in its organization. Okay, so we to address this type of model, we looked at what how mitochondria were organized within cells by doing in situ hybridization uh, with DNA probes and mitochondria have their own DNA. And what we found is that there are about a threefold increase in mitochondrial DNA in neurons at risk. There's also about a threefold increase in mitochondrial enzymes. But these, but there's actually no increase in mitochondria. We did these from biopsy samples taken early during the course of Alzheimer's disease many years ago. And um, why I mentioned many years ago, it's not considered ethical to take biopsies for Alzheimer's disease any longer. Um, and if anything, there's less mitochondria than there is um, in AD. And where did these go? This is where, uh, consistent with the idea of the autophagosomes, consistent with the studies of Ralph Nixon, that very early on the course of the disease, and in fact, we see at about age 40 that people begin to accumulate within autophagosomes mitochondrial DNA. These do not look very much like mitochondria because they're not, but they have mitochondrial DNA. And if we look where the extra protein is, it's diffused in the cytoplasm. Okay, so we then looked at mitochondrial dynamics, uh, both fusion fission as well as transport. And we documented this by looking at tubulin levels and microtubules actually are decreased greatly during the course of the disease. And I might add actually decreased with aging. We've done this at protein level more recently and it has to do with there's even a shift in the type of microtubules that are present. But the one thing that we could recapitulate in culture much better was looking at fusion fission properties because mitochondria are extremely dynamic and there's different proteins. I'm going to talk about dynamic related protein or dynamic like protein. People call it different names, and we've used the name they use in their publication. And if you look at these fusion proteins, you can see that they change quite a bit. There's about a 75% reduction in dynamic like protein one in Alzheimer's disease versus control. And again, it's specific to the large neurons. It also is true for fibroblasts. They show not a 75%, but a 50%. And if you look at the fibroblasts, you can see that there's an organization of clustering uh, mitochondria around the nucleus, as well as becoming larger. And that was true when we reanalyzed the micrographs uh, that I showed earlier. The mitochondria in the case of Alzheimer's disease are slightly larger, well, slightly, almost twice as large. Okay, and then this changes the dynamics and amyloid precursor protein plays a role. So in summary, what we think is that, I mean, these studies demonstrate and what we think about it is that normally mitochondria are well distributed within neurons down the synapse. Now we've looked at these regions. We looked at the axon hillock, we published that, and we're doing a study now of synapses in mitochondria, which will be completed shortly. And in Alzheimer's disease, instead, you have much greater distances between these energy power sources and a lot more refuse um, garbage from mitochondria accumulating. Also, this you know this changes could be due to poor turnover, and we've also studied that. So there appears to be problems with transport, problems in fusion fission, and problems in removal. Now. One of the things is uh, relating this to uh, uh, microbial origin is that we've looked at various times we've seen hints that there is microbial involvement. One of them is an early study that we did in which we looked for chitin-like polysaccharides, which are not normally present within human samples. 
but they are within fun fungal samples. And we found that as a consistent finding in Alzheimer's disease. The other thing is that the mitochondria itself is basically a bacteria that's within, within a neuron. So we're investigating, but I don't have the data to present right now, particularly looking at mitochondrial DNA release and its effect on the brain and on cells derived from the brain. Okay, but back to therapeutics, how does amyloid fit into all this stuff? Well, one of the things is, is that, you know, as was mentioned earlier, amyloid could have been causal. That's what was considered to be the case because of the genetics. But it's important to remember that genetics does not show causality. What it shows is strong association. So amyloid is clearly strongly associated with the disease, but is it causative? I would say that the recent trials actually show that it's not causative, but strongly associated because of the fact that there wasn't reversal. So when we looked at oxidative stress and quantitated it, looking at a per neuron basis, this is a case of L uh, Down syndrome, several cases of different ages. People with Down syndrome develop Alzheimer type pathology very early in life, in their teenage and early 20s. And so you don't, you've sort of separated the aging aspect. And if you look at those, you can see strong oxidative stress marked by blue. And if you look at an older person with Down syndrome, 61 is old for somebody with Down syndrome, you see that you can barely see the neuron stained. And here, oxidative stress predates amyloid by at least a decade. Okay, that's important. And if you look at it further, there's a strong negative relationship with R squareds of 0.95. When we looked at sporadic Alzheimer disease, we found the same thing, not linear, but highly correlated in which we see amyloid burden. The more amyloid is present in the brain of people, the more, less oxidative damage. Okay, so that certainly isn't consistent with causation. It's important to note that controls also have amyloid, but there's no relationship to uh, oxidation. And this, much like Down syndrome, is a curve of duration. The longer the disease, the less oxidative damage. Remember, this is done on a per neuron basis. So neuron losses, not explain it. Let's see what happened here. Wow. Oh, this is great. Wow. Uh, that one was just showing, the, the one that I couldn't show was uh, genetically caused Alzheimer's disease. And the same properties go, it's amyloid ending at residue 42 that has the effect that's true for all of the prior work. So to understand how amyloid, if it is playing a role to reduce oxidative damage, since it's correlated with what is the mechanism? So initially we looked at isolated plaques, and that's what these are. This is stained with Congo red. And we did Raman spectroscopy, looking how metals are organized with it. We found that they had copper, but not iron bound directly to proteins there. We also did studies, uh, several different studies, but this is one of them, showing that when amyloid binds copper, it actually redox suppresses it. So this is the ability of copper, which all by itself will catalyze um, oxidation of lipids. And if you add amyloid at one to one ratio, it's essentially blocked. So then we embarked on studies in mostly in San Antonio, in fact, this first studies are totally done here, is that we looked at how the metals were organized within plaques. So these are isolated plaques, but different from what most people show. These are plaques that have not been contrasted with any external metals. There's no uranium, no osmium, no lead. And so the electron density is created totally by the fibers themselves. And you'll notice there's little particles in between. Okay, and in those particles, you can do uh, atomic resolution microscopy. And we were able to look at the particles and their crystal spacing is exactly that expected for magnetite, which is an iron two, iron three crystal. And we demonstrated that they had magnetic properties using a couple different approaches. And if you have magnetite, you think it's always gonna be magnetic, but that's not always the case. It depends on the size of the particle, and these are right at the borderline. Okay, and then the more recently, work, work with um, Joanna Collinwood in the um, 
and the UK, we actually directly analyzed the redox state because we were particularly interested to know if there was copper zero, excuse me, copper one uh, and copper two pairs matching with the iron two, iron three pairs that we had already demonstrated by the magnetite. And when we did that, what we found was that there's actually really surprisingly, surprisingly, because it's never been shown before, iron zero. Okay, and there's copper zero, but iron zero is the most miraculous thing. And you see it's a dominant piece of, from the spectra. It's 70%, 54%. So it's a dominant piece that there's iron metal. Um, the only time that we've been able to find in the literature where these type of metals, the iron and copper uh, at a fully reduced state exist is in microbes. Doesn't say microbes are doing it or it isn't mitochondria or something else. So we're actively looking at, at this. We're doing the same experiments in tangles, which are ongoing, and the results are different. They have the metals, but they're not at this reduced state. Um, amyloid beta will actually is capable of producing copper um, to quite a reduced state. That's what this mass spectra uh, work demonstrates. But I think this is just the beginning of the uh, of this approach because it's because it's a stoichiometric approach. Okay. So with this idea, we developed it amyloid and, and tau. For tau, I have not presented the work, but tau is associated with heme oxygenase, an important antioxidant. And uh, tau expression and phosphorylation plays an important role in its oxidation susceptibility and interactions and co-expression with heme oxygenase. So that's an important antioxidant. And why is heme oxygenase important? If you're releasing mitochondrial um, enzymes, you have to metabolize those hemes. And amyloid beta, we think, plays a critical role in mitochondrial turnover in terms of suppressing redox activity. And this means that neurons in Alzheimer's disease may be using amyloid um, to suppress damage rather than cause. So it's closely associated and may be useful to modulate, but you wouldn't want to remove it completely. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease, we're thinking that Alzheimer's disease fits into the same path as a lot of other homeostatic diseases probably ones that also involve microbes and chronic inflammation. And do the abnormalities mark a new homeostatic balance, like similar to hibernation? And um, that um, our findings that uh, the pentose phosphate pathway is induced early during the course of the disease suggests that there's a fundamental metabolic shift away from energy metabolism to protective metabolism. And further, this suggests that targeting the abnormalities without understanding what they do could imbalance neuronal survival. And I think many of you have seen the question in the amyloid vaccine approach that the brain actually shrinks during the course of treatment. Okay, so what I presented is that cytoplasmic oxidate damage is an early feature of Alzheimer's disease, back to highest levels during the MCI, mild cognitive impairment. And mitochondrial abnormalities are critical to these oxidative abnormalities. Um, we think mainly through the fent providing metals for the fenting chemistry and primary oxidants. And amyloid beta and um, APP are linked to mitochondrial turnover for some of the reasons I've presented, as well as others from other, other work. And novel iron and Copper redox chemistry is associated especially with tang plaques that we've demonstrated. And say novel because iron, essentially metallic iron, doesn't exist in the earth. It rusts immediately unless it came in from a meteorite. And finally, the pathology is a homeostatic response to disease, whether it be inflammation from uh, chronic bacterial infection or viruses, et cetera and that removal of the pathology will have, at best, marginal benefit. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry. 
Uh, now I just want to kind of open up the floor for the next five minutes or so if anyone has any questions. Let's see. Yeah, so maybe I have a question. <laughs> Is that the one you have there in the chat? Yes, yes. I had a question regarding this inverse correlation in Apple E4 carrier versus non-carrier, if I saw this correctly. Uh, uh, no, both of them had it. Both uh, of them okay. have the okay. both have the inverse. It's just better correlated with the E4. Okay. And the reason is that the E4 people accumulate more amyloid as the disease progresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah. And the non-E4 also accumulate more amyloid, but less. Or less, yeah. Less so striking the correlation. Both of them have an inverse relationship that's statistically mm -hmm. significant. Okay. And um, yeah, I was also wondering because we know that uh, amyloid uh, has this antimicrobial trap properties, whether this is uh, also something you're investigated uh, with the relationship of the uh, amyloid on on the reduction of those um, those um, uh, metals. Uh, we're not actively investigating um, that aspect directly. We are looking at amyloids effect on uh, excuse me well yeah amyloids effect on um, mitochondrial dna effect on amyloid assembly mm -hmm. as well as toxicity and there's been other people who have done similar experiments mm -hmm. but we haven't done the trapping mm -hmm. aspect okay thank you well, i see we have a hand raised if you'd yes. like to go ahead Sorry, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I'm Jean-Marie Hanoli, I'm a more clinician and uh, working also with Lavinia had, had uh, some work together. I had a question about these mitochondrial humanities, which I wasn't so much aware of. Uh, are, do you find them also in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the same families, in normal controls i don't I, it's very difficult to see what is a normal control but um <laughs> uh, uh, no <laughs> uh, in, in normal in normal control of um of alzheimer patients mm. uh, I, the, the the point i was making is that you have that independently of uh, cognitive uh, decline Ah, well, I'll address that and we there's an age related component to this for anybody who's over 40, late 30s and 40s, you will already start to see essentially all the things I described, but at a low, very low level. And um, then there's a disease-related component. And the mitochondrial uh, work, there's been many investigators, not all, not all of the findings were made by us. Flint Beal has contributed greatly, Russell Swerdlow. Many people have demonstrated that. Uh, in fact, the earliest work is probably from Portugal and from um, John Blas and Cornell, um, in which they actually, in the case of John Blas, demonstrated that um, the peripheral cells, blood cells, already show these type of changes, yeah. particularly dealing with the Krebs cycle. Mm -hmm. Let's see, Jim Tussard is asking about oxy oxytosis and ferroptosis. Yeah, we're actively looking at those elements um, in our studies otherwise. In fact, we have grant funding for looking at those particular approaches uh, because, and the person who's doing this with me is, um, I'm convinced that the cells are assaulted by death responses like apoptosis, viroptosis, et cetera, but spend most of their energy trying to resist it because so, they're not directly dying. What's that? Following on that, Ina Slutsky in, in Israel has been working on this area, and there's some call, uh, enzyme called DH0, uh, ODH, that is uh, uh, retards to ferritosis, oxytosis, and it also changes the 
uh, firing rate in the background, the average firing rate, and it also shows up when you do anesthesia, the difference. Mm. So uh, that seems to tie directly into this iron issue because DH, 0H is uh, OH, ODH is, uh, is deals with the toxicity of iron. Uh, so it's directly related somewhere to this iron issue. So it seems to be a central idea that ties into what happens to firing rates of, neuro, uh, of unhealthy neurons that, that uh, is caused by this change in level of DH, uh, ODH. I'm gonna have to look at this, Jim. You can send me some references. Well, Ina Slutsky in, in uh, uh, Israel just spoke at the Oscar Fisher uh, lecture series. You can look at her video on the subject as well as her papers. Okay. Which this. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you, Dr. Truchard, uh, for the excellent question and Dr. Perry for the wonderful presentation. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure to introduce our next colleague and friend here, uh, Dr. Brian Balin. Uh, Dr. Balin is uh, a professor of neuroscience and neuropathology. He is at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, where he is the director of the Center for Chronic Disorders of Aging. Um, Brian has been publishing on the uh, relationship between the intracellular bacterium chlamydia pneumoniae and Alzheimer's disease since 1998, uh, and is a wealth of expertise on the pathogen hypothesis of Alzheimer's, which he will speak about today. Brian? Uh, thank you, Nikki. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, not just yet. Uh, we don't see any slides, but we see you. Okay, let me go back. Um, uh, let's see here. Shepard and slideshow. Okay. Um, uh, how about now? No, are you are you able? Are you using the green uh, share screen button at the bottom? Uh, let's go. Okay, so. Uh, Let's share screen. Okay. Um, I'm clicking on that slideshow. Did that come up? It did not. Lavinia, do we have settings ah. um, for? No, everything is uh, the share screen option is, I think it's gone. Oh, here it is. How, how about now? Yes, okay. it, it is now cooperating. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alberry and uh, the Brain Fit for Life for inviting me to speak today. And also Nikki Schultek with Intracell Research Group. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be here and present on the pathogen hypothesis of late onset Alzheimer's disease. This is something that I've been working on uh, for about the last 25 years. And I can show you the collaborators that we've had here as well over this amount of time. And I especially want to acknowledge uh, the uh, Alan and Judy Hudson, that group, uh, and uh, uh, Chris Hammond, Dr. Zappelt, and Little, who have worked directly with me here at BCOM. Uh, for many, many years on this whole issue. And of course, you see the funding sources and students and other collaborations as well, which ha actually have gone now even into uh, an international collaborations. So the learning objectives that I wanted to address today are, are listed here with uh, some of the epidemiological factors, uh, signs and risk factors for AD, of course, and this hypothesis of pathogens uh, and their involvement. And I wanna really focus on how neuroinflammation and uh, the bridging of amyloid actually has occurred. 
um, and and why why that is what we think is very important, and specifically on this organism that we discovered in Alzheimer's disease, uh, and we first published in 1998, Chlamydia pneumoniae, which is a respiratory chlamydial organism. So obviously the classification of Alzheimer's disease, we have sporadic and familial. Sporadic is the mo very most common form. Uh, typically we think of 65 years of age and older. It can occur even at, at some younger ages as well. Uh, but we think of this as more of the late onset Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, 95 to 98% of the population that gets Alzheimer's disease has this form. Of course, familial disease has its, uh, its basis in genetic mutations, uh, which we have known for some time, and is the more minor form. Obviously, it's just as serious. Um, so we'll, we'll talk more about the late onset form as we go forward. Age is the number one risk factor, obviously. Uh, genetics also plays a role, and there are a lot of genetic risk factors, especially the apolipoprotein E, uh, epsilon 4, as, a, as an increased risk factor. And there are other risk factors too, genetic risk factors as well, that in combination may, along with environmental factors, uh, uh, really be involved with why this disease is occurring in later age. The other risk factors are general types of things that such as atherosclerosis and diabetes and head injury, uh, toxins we, we think could be involved too, and infection. And this is where we came into uh, the realm with infection. But let me first show you what you see here in a normal brain on the left-hand side of the slide, a lateral view, and then a, a coronal section uh, demonstrating things such as your, your gyri are, are these the, the pieces of brain here that are actually now compressed, containing all the, the uh, neurons in the upper cortex regions. And then down in here in the coronal section, I'm circling the areas of the hippocampus, where um, these, these are the key areas that we, we find that are changed early in the disease and, of course, later in the disease as well for uh, the formulation of learning and short-term memory, et cetera. Over here on the right-hand side, we see an Alzheimer brain, the lateral view showing you now this increased spacing between the gyri, the gyri actually shrunken. The gyri actually now have uh, atrophied, the cells have atrophied. And that's why the mass literally is changed here in an Alzheimer brain. Um, if you think of it that, an Alzheimer, a normal brain would weigh about 1,250 grams. An Alzheimer brain may weigh 1,000 grams. So you're losing a significant amount of mass. And then with the coronal section, you see the uh, in the center, the ventricular system is enlarged because you're losing the mass around the ventricular system. And also down here, you're losing the hippocampal formation. Uh, it is being uh, atrophied as well. Uh, and, and the whole temporal lobe here is, looks like it's atrophied. The pathology, which Dr. Perry sort of went into as well with these tangles and uh, neuritic senile plaques. The tangles really are parenthelical filaments made of the tau protein that's phosphorylated, it's hyperphosphorylated. And we see images here in neurons, but also in a plaque area where you see these dystrophic neurites. And then with the neuritic senile plaques, amyloid plaques, uh, principally various forms of amyloid are now accumulating there. We, we often think of the A beta 1 to 42 peptide as being the most uh, fibrillogenic and one that's going to accumulate mostly over time and is more of the toxic form. Um, these accumulations uh, are due to enzymatic digestion of a transmembrane amyloid precursor protein into these smaller peptides. And here we have just a, a schematic showing you a non-amyloidogenic uh, process versus a pro-amyloidogenic process focused on the different enzymes here. So if you have alpha secretases being actually uh, increased and in, in being in their activity, you won't get these peptides that we find in Alzheimer's disease you'll find that you get a more of a soluble amyloid that's being uh, cleaved. 
and you don't get the peptide forms. But if you get beta secretases and gamma secretases activated at increased levels or due to mutation, where now you're getting increased activity because you now have mutated enzymes, you're now going to generate these A beta peptide forms that will start to accumulate in brain tissue. And these are not working uh, in, in a vacuum. There are other proteins involved with this process, which are down listed down here on the bottom of the slide as well. So anyway, this is amyloid generation is what we're thinking here is, is what's obviously happening in the disease process. So we have what's developed over time is an amyloid cascade hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease, both in familial Alzheimer's disease and late onset Alzheimer's disease. And amyloid obviously is playing a role, as Dr. Perry had mentioned as well. Uh, and then later on, the tau protein plays a role as well because of the generation of neurofibrillary tangles, et cetera. Uh, but we believe that neuroinflammation is playing even a bigger role. And a lot in the research world for Alzheimer's disease have focused on, started to focus on neuroinflammation. But what's interesting here is that often they're um, ascribing the neuroinflammation uh, that follows from the generation of amyloid and the activation of microglial cells and astroglial cells, et cetera. We believe the neuroinflammation actually can be a precursor to any of the pathologies that you're seeing in the disease process. And this is where we have this merging of hypothesis and uh, we think that the infection hypothesis or pathogen hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease is really the center point that's been missed linking the types of, of uh, information we've acquired from uh, uh, studying Alzheimer brain tissues. And that is the pathology as well as the inflammation that's well accepted now as being a chronic inflammation. So what's the hypothesis with pathogens? Well, uh, pathogenic microbes, depending on their ability to enter the brain or trigger inflammatory responses, can result in activation of pathways that coincide with neurodegenerative responses. There you get amyloid uh, generation and deposition, as well as eventual tau uh, neurofibrillar tangle formation. Now, that hypothesis is uh, limited to microbes that are entering into the brain we will readily accept that you can have microbes in the gut, for instance, that can contribute to the problem by making neurotransmitters of uh, having systemic uh, uh, infections, potentially even having microbes that could travel through things like the vagal nerve from the gut into the brain. So we are open to those possibilities as well. What's interesting here is here's a, a, a slide of proposed infectious agents. It's not, actually what I have here are major issues that have been found for many, many years in Alzheimer brain tissues. And people are still finding other evidence for other types of uh, uh, microbial involvement. But what we've studied is the chlamydia pneumoniae story and published uh, you know, as early as 1998 and continue to publish on this organism. It's an intracellular bacterium. And I'll talk more about this. The herpes simplex virus issue with uh, Ruth Itsaki has been proposing for many, many years, going back to the early 1990s, actually is something that is still present with us and we think there is involvement there. Borrelia species uh, with Lyme disease, uh, Judith McLossy and Alan McDonald actually proposed a long time ago, um, actually still is something we should be considering. Uh, and, and there are still findings of uh, uh, finding that you can have this type of organism, it's a spirochetal organism in human brain tissues. Also, Helicobacter pylori, uh, for, uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis have come onto the scene. Uh, there could be involvement, uh, especially with periodontitis. So we have to include that in the equation. Some other oral organisms, especially the treponemes and gut microbiota, which I mentioned. Some fungal species, Candida, Toxoplasma gondii, a parasite. 
which uh, there are a number of people thinking that this could also trigger uh, changes in brain in Alzheimer's disease, leading to uh, 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 the, the disease process. Some other types of viruses like the human herpes virus six and seven. And then we go down to SARS-CoV-2, which, which uh, Lavinia had mentioned also earlier. This has opened the door to us now because of a pandemic to realizing that there are millions that are suffering from neurocognitive change after getting infections with this virus. Uh, there are a couple of key points here. One is there seems to be an influence with sense of smell and the olfactory regions of our nose and into the olfactory regions of our brains that are being insulted. And I say insulted because many times we're not finding the virus in brain tissue proper, but there has been damage to that particular area. That particular area is key to understanding how the limbic system, of which the hippocampus is a major component, and the amygdala, entorhinal cortex, et cetera, are key to the development of not only Alzheimer's disease, but other types of dementing and neurodegenerative processes um, in, in, that we have seen in older age. So now I'm going to talk about more of the chlamydia pneumoniae story that we've been studying. A ubiquitous respiratory pathogen. It's uh, implicated in things like community acquired pneumonias, in asthma, in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, in atherosclerosis. There are thousands of articles describing this organism with atherosclerosis. Um, we have been studying it with Alzheimer's disease, uh, also with cutaneous T cell lymphoma. So, this is an organism that, if it's inhaled, it can get to numerous parts of the body. And the inhalation part of this is important, we think, with both the olfactory in insult as well as lung insult. It's an intracellular, obligate intracellular organism. It needs cellular ATP and other nutrients. And this goes to what Dr. Perry had mentioned uh, about the mitochondrial issues seen in Alzheimer's disease. When this organism is on board in cells, mitochondria are shown to be stressed and they often change their shapes and ATP is being depleted from mitochondria to be uh, basically utilized by this organism. And the organism will typically grow inside of a cell in vacuoles and multiply inside of vacuoles and uh, in intercommunicate with the cytoplasm in the cells uh, by siphoning in ATP, uh, tryptophan, other nutrients from the cell, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of evidence that elderly people have been exposed to chlamydia pneumonia just through serology as well, looking for antibodies uh, in their blood. So this is now a, a brief description of what we found and published in 1998. And we did it first by molecular analysis with a polymerase chain reaction and uh, RT-PCR looking for message for the organism. And then we did a lot of EM, immunohistochemistry, in situ hybridization, et cetera. And what you see here is an electron micrograph of the organism, both the, the arrowheads pointing out the reticulate or body form, which is the actively growing form, and the dense form here, which is the elementary body form, which is actually the infectious form in this organism. This is an EM taken from an Alzheimer brain demonstrating this organism present in that tissue. What we also did was we wanted to show that uh, uh, because of the RT-PCR data from frozen tissue, telling us that there was active message that was now present in frozen brain tissue for this organism, we thought, well, maybe we could grow the organism out. Maybe it now is in a stasis form with frozen tissue. And certainly uh, what we did was we took homogenates of AD brain tissues and put them in culture with human monocytes. And because this organism will only grow inside of another cell type, we found that it would grow there and did. And so we have light microscopy through A, B, and C here and electron microscopy by D and E. If you do immunolabeling, which we did also for these organisms with specific antibodies to chlamydia pneumonia, it labels these organisms. So we, we are pretty confident that that's what we found from our human brains. For uh, future human studies now and, and later human studies that we've done, 
uh, led to an understanding that glia can be infected, neurons can be infected, endothelial cells in brain tissues can be infected, and the entorhinal cortex, hippocampus, uh, it was commonly involved. The uh, entry mechanism, we think, is the nasal olfactory neuropathelium, as well as through the blood-brain barrier, which I'm going to describe in a moment. What we've been able to determine, too, through some small clinical sampling of individuals with mild cognitive impairment and also early Alzheimer's disease, uh, early late onset Alzheimer's disease, I should say, um, is that in the white blood cells from blood, for what we call the Buffy coat, if you analyze those white blood cells, you can often find evidence for these infectious agents inside the white blood cell, which tells us that this organism can actually get into the blood, and we think from the lungs. And, and the rationale behind that is that others have shown that monocytes actually can, when they're surveilling in the vasculature of the lung, can actually pick up presence of this organism from lung tissue and traffic it back into the bloodstream. And we think this is why it also would be involved with atherosclerosis and other systemic issues in the body. So here are the roots of infection. We have uh, the respiratory infection in Homer Simpson's brain going from olfaction and then into lungs and then getting into the circulation as well, leading to now an infection in brain tissue. What's interesting, early on, even with Alzheimer's disease and, and also with Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia and some other diseases, it's been found that our sense of smell is altered. And this was an article by uh, Dev Devanan in 2000, uh, quoting that the findings suggest that the inability to recognize smells combined with the lack of awareness of impaired odor perception may be a sign of impending Alzheimer's disease. Well, this now really fits quite well, unfortunately, with what we have found with COVID. And now with COVID and COVID-2 infection and, and now change in sense of smell, is it in, indicative that you're going to go on and have levels of neurocognitive change? We don't think it's happening in everyone, but we think it actually can set the stage for that process to occur with that particular virus as well. So what we did was we wanted to also understand Okay, can we transmit this organism from uh, isolated from a human brain into a mouse, a normal mouse, and could we like inoculate the animal intranasal uh, process and allow for the organism to enter in a normal route through respiration? And sure enough, here is the brown labeling in A and B demonstrating the organism because it's an immuno, it's an antibody labeled for the organism, showing you evidence in the olfactory neuropathelium and then in the olfactory bulb, and down, down below by electron microscopy, that in olfactory bulbs, you have presence of the organism there. So we know that the organism actually can be picked up this way. There are other recent studies by a, a group from uh, Australia that published last year on this very same process happening when you infect animals. Uh, and the process can happen fairly readily. Within three days is what they found that you could have now the infectious agent entering into the olfactory bulbs uh, of the, the uh, brain of the animal. And we think once it's there, it can then traffic into the limbic regions of the brain. Here we found that you could also generate amyloid A beta 1 to 42 plaques in a normal mouse brain, which doesn't typically happen. And the, the brown labels in these different micrographs are indicative of A beta 1 to 42 labeled uh, in the mouse brain. Other studies showing that once you've infected the animals, you can retrieve the organism back out of the olfactory bulbs and at times in the brain. And uh, with with low um, uh, inoculum versus high inoculum. It's found that uh, the higher inoculum leads to more organism present in brain tissue of animals. And what we did here was after 28 days of infection of a six month animal and a 20 month animal, you could see that uh, over here to the right lower panel, 
that the higher amount was actually occurring when you have a five times 10 to the fifth inoculum of chlamydia pneumonia in an old brain in an old animal is showing up now at a higher concentration in the animal's brain suggesting to us that the age of the animal also is now allowing for more infection to actually get into brain tissue uh to to demonstrate whether or not a blood brain barrier could be invaded we did an in vitro model here where you took human brain microvascular endothelial cells and human monocytes infected both of them and realized that when you do that the junctional complexes between the endothelial cells open transiently and the infected monocytes traffic through there and this gives us proof of principle that this actually could be happening also in humans because we use human cells here in an in vitro barrier, suggesting that this organism could be trafficking into human brains by first infecting monocytes from the lung and then through the circulation. Other cellular mechanisms, autophagy has been demonstrated to be initiated, apoptosis, which is very interesting here. So autophagy actually is now the self-eating process where um, uh, Dr. Perry mentioned a little bit of that with autophagosomes showing mitochondrial proteins within the autophagosomes. Well, we're showing that with infection, you actually initiate this process inside of nerve cells, glial cells, as well as neurons. What's interesting here with the apoptosis story is, is intriguing to us because when you have infection of these cells, which is now demonstrated with this uh, yellow gold labeling in the A and B cells above, you actually can inhibit apoptosis from occurring. You're damaging mitochondria, but you're blocking the, the particular proteins that actually now allow for the mitochondria to sort of stimulate the caspase activities inside the cells to allow for apoptosis to occur. So you're actually blocking cell death here when you have this infection on board. Calcium dysregulation has been noted too, and the organism is a, is a sink for calcium as well as for iron, which goes to Dr. Perry's story as well, which is very interesting to us that this, this infection in particular uh, allows for sinking of those particular types of ions. Inflammasome activation we've noted it occurs as well. This is through toll-like receptors, and it leads to the generation of NF-kappa B, which is a transcription factor that turns on the production of and trans, uh, late, transcription and translation of interferon of uh, 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 interleukins uh, IL-1 beta and IL-18 and IL-33, pro-inflammatory cytokines. We also saw this in vitro over a five-day course of infection of monocytes, where you could actually now demonstrate that monocytes can be long-term infected over five days. Others have shown even for weeks uh, with this particular infection because it's inhibiting apoptosis. And when you do that, you're also stimulating the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. If this is getting into the brain, these pro-inflammatory cytokines are, are now really throwing uh, into uh, uh, now a jeopardy all of these, this inflammatory process that you see in Alzheimer's disease. The other thing we did was we looked at astrocytes in culture and found that because they were infected in brain tissues at times, that we wanted to see what happens in culture with astrocytes and found that over here to the right-hand side, if you infect astrocytes in culture and the yellow shows the infection uh, that's now been immunolabeled for chlamydia pneumonia after 48 hours, the red dots in there are labeled for A beta 1 to 42. You actually get an increase in A beta 1 to 42 when you get infection of astrocytes, which we think is also a contributor to that A beta that gets generated in Alzheimer's disease. And then if you look at secretase activity, when you have the infection on board, you'll see that over a 72 hour of infection to the left and over to the right, 72 hours of infection, Beta secretase and gamma secretase activities both go up. 
telling us that you're actually now generating amyloid by cleaving the the precursor protein into the the bad forms of amyloid. In a comparison summary between Alzheimer's disease and chlamydia pneumonia infection, if you look on the left-hand side in Alzheimer's disease, if you just look at what's happened in the disease process and you didn't even consider infection in the process, you have all of these events that have been noted, okay? And now if you look at the chlamydia pneumonia infection and how it, it affects cells and how it could get into brain tissues, you'll see there's a superimposition on all of the different deficits we see with Alzheimer's disease or changes when you have chlamydia pneumonia infection on board, which suggests to us that this is not a coincidence that this is a type of organism that could lead to the changes that we see in the disease process. And I just want to uh, conclude with a couple of slides showing that others have taken this very seriously as well. And there are anti-infection clinical trials that either have been run or are being run. The problem with these trials though, is that uh, other than for just a couple that have been looking at virus, especially the herpes virus, has there been a specificity toward what is the infectious agent that we're showing to be involved with Alzheimer's disease? And so we need to find out and, and to, to have more trials run actually after we determine what is on board in an individual. And that goes to now developing more of an understanding of a consensus of what are the infectious agents possibly on board in a person and now personalizing your treatment to that. And I just want to end my talk with the last slide here, which is my favorite quote of all time by Albert and Georgie of discovery consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking what nobody has thought. And uh, uh, I think more and more are thinking now that uh, we do have infectious involvement in this process. So thank you again for your attention and I will end the slideshow. Thank you, Dr. Balin, that was excellent. Um, we do have some questions, which I'll take briefly before we move on to our next speaker. Um, so we have uh, a comment from Dr. Trichard uh, about gingipane <laughs> going to the brain, uh, but not actually P. gingivalis itself going to the brain. I guess that's more of a comment um, and a question about whether you observed chlamydia entrapped within amyloid aggregates in the olfactory epithelium uh, and or other brain structures and can chlamydia alter olfaction? So we believe that chlamydia can actually alter olfaction because of, of it, its uh, ready ability to now enter those cells. And that is still a process that uh, others are looking at and we're looking at as well. Um, as far as entrapped within the amyloid aggregates, no, what's interesting here is that we think the chlamydia is actually activating the processing of amyloid so that when we see the infected cells in human brain tissues, uh, we find that amyloid is nearby as if it's now being deposited out and walling off almost an area where you have infected cells which is very interesting to us because it, it's, it's sort of uh, indicating that there is a response. Now, why is the amyloid doing that? We don't know. The, the organism will be released periodically, but often it stays harbored inside of cells that uh, have been infected for a length of time. We believe that the persistence of the organism is probably more of an issue here than an acute infection. Retrospective. Can you see it, Brian? Yeah, it can increase the risk of dementia conversion. Um, so there have been a couple of epidemiological studies, one, one coming out of Taiwan, suggesting that if you treat for chlamydia pneumonia infections, that you can diminish the risk for later onset dementia, which is interesting because there's another, other studies have shown that with herpes as well. That, that if you treat for that, that you're diminishing that. Um, so we, we think that 
what's been missed here is that people have been infected with this organism and because it's subclinical, they don't know it. And now you start to get changes over periods of time because of more of the persistent presence of this organism and possibly quite uh, quite other organisms as well. So this isn't happening in a vacuum, we don't think as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Balin. And uh, the point you make is well made, right? This this concept of precision and, and really figuring out what's going on in the individual patient and then targeting um, you know, we're developing therapeutics that target specific underlying drivers. Um, so excellent, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Next up, uh, really pleased to introduce Dr. Wendy Q. Um, Dr. Q is an MD, PhD uh, in the, the Department of uh, Psychiatry as well as Experimental Pharmacology and Therapeutics at Boston University. Um, it is an absolute honor to have you with us today and to have you share with us your presentation, which is monomeric C-reactive protein via endothelial CD31 for neurovascular inflammation in an APOE genotype dependent pattern, a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Dr. Q, whenever you're ready, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Nikki and also Lavinia uh, for inviting me to share our research data with you. Um, just a minute, let me see. Okay, the title uh, of my talk today is Monomeric C-reactive protein um, virus uh, anoxidil CD31. Uh, to mediate neurovascular uh, inflammation in APOE genotype dependent pattern, we think this is a risk factor of Alzheimer's disease. I want to share this slide with you. If you see uh, the left panel, uh, this is very, uh, very famous research. We have found more than 30 uh, genes associated with Alzheimer's disease uh, risk. Here, the y-axis is the risk level uh, and uh, x-axis the uh, frequency in the population. So you can see some genes like APP, uh, PS1, PS2, uh, which genes have 100% penetrate. However, majority, most genes, almost all the genes for late onset Alzheimer's disease, the risk level is, is low. You know, even APOE4 uh, allele is about median risk level. What does that mean? That means some APOE4 carriers did not develop Alzheimer's disease even when they are 90 years old, suggesting some other factors, either environmental or internal uh, factors impact these uh, genetics genes to cause Alzheimer's disease, but all these late onset Alzheimer's disease genes, you can see frequency uh, high, but uh, risk level is low. Uh, the right panel shows uh, the structure of blood brain barrier. And uh, um, you can see the, uh, the out layer of the BBB is endothelia. Um, that's why we uh, hypothesized that peripheral uh, chronic low-grade inflammation impact some of these uh, genetic uh, risk factors. Just a minute, let me. Uh, um, impact these genetic factors to uh, uh, enhance Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. Here, I want to show one example. This uh, study, uh, we published in 2018, we used the Birmingham Heart Study and we divided them into APOE2, 3, 4 genotypes. And then we divided them into a uh, different level of C, uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, lower than three, higher than three milligram uh, per liter or higher than eight milligram 
gram per liter. So you can see CRP levels, which is um, the in, uh, important factor of peripheral inflammation, did not really uh, infect APOE2 and 3 in terms of Alzheimer's incidence. However, look at APOE4 carriers. This is lower than 3, higher than 3, high, higher than 8. As CRP levels increased, Alzheimer's disease incidence is increased. Here, this slide shows another study our, uh, of our group, which is in press recently. We are uh, uh, using two cohorts. One is uh, UK Bell Bank. Uh, the other one is a Birmingham Heart Study. We chose 10 um, Alzheimer's-related genes which are also related to inflammation. And then we, uh, we studied how um, uh, uh, elevated CRP impact Alzheimer's disease incidence. So you can see we found among 10 genes of them, we found two genes, SPI1 and CD33, uh, increase um, CRP levels uh, really affect AA carrier. In, uh, those dependent increase the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, same as uh, 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 Birmingham Heart Study. CD33, the same, um, increase CC carriers in both cohorts, but the other uh, carriers, GG plus GA, uh, increased, the uh, increased the CRP levels didn't affect AD incidence. This is another study we use the ADI cohort. In ADI cohort, again, uh, in, um, S, uh, in SPI1 carriers, you can see AA carriers increase CRP levels, increased AD conversion from MCI, but GGGA carriers increased CRP levels didn't affect them, and same as in CD33 carriers. Thing. Uh, the other thing is we use the uh, CSF total tau and p-tau data again in AA carriers of SPI1, uh, total tau and p-tau increased, you can see here, here, but not in GG uh, and GA carriers. In CD33, again, that increased uh, CRP level increased uh, uh, correlated with increased total tau and the PTAL, but not in the, uh, in the other counterpart carriers. So all these uh, human data suggested to us that peripheral information impact some of late onset Alzheimer's disease genes to enhance Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. And uh, uh, here, uh, the, the next part of my talk, I'm going to focus on how CRP impacts APOE4 allele uh, for Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. Uh, CRP is a pentamer in acute stage of infection inflammation. However, during chronic stage, um, the pentamer dissociated into monomer and um, uh, the study design is here. We use the APOE not in mice, and then we peripherally uh, 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 intraperitoneal inject injected of CRP, either PCRP, pentamer, or monomeric CRP into, um, into these mice, and then we separate by them. So you can see, and then we did immunostaining you can see the panel here, panel B here, compared to APOE2 and 3, almost very little CRP deposit in those brains. However, look at APOE4, significant MCRP deposit in APOE4 brain. So all these, um, uh, uh, we also did a, a co-localization of the uh, of uh, immunostaining, we found these MCRP co-stained with the biomarkers of endothelial cells, including CD31, CD144, and lectin. However, they are not co-localized with neuron, microglia, and astrocytes. 
this slide shows that we use uh, proximity ligation assay of the brains with different APOE types after injection of peripheral MCRP. Uh, so you can see again, those orange color that in cortex and, uh, and uh, hippocampus, only in APOE4 brains, significant binding of MCRP and CD31, but, but not much in APOE2 and APOE3 uh, brains. We also isolated, isolated micro uh, capillaries from these, brain, from these mice. Uh, from the brains. And then you can see that APOE4 brains, this is MCRP staining significantly of them have um, uh, MCRP deposit in a uh, uh, cold staining in a, a micro vessel, but not in APOE2 uh, uh, micro vessels. Also CD31, uh, more of them are phosphorylated in APOE4 brains than APOE2 brains. And um, and this is CD31. You can see MCRP and uh, CD31 are co-localized. And this uh, shows other biomarkers of, um, of uh, 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 endothelial like uh, VWF and CD144, as I just mentioned. Okay, this slide shows after peripheral uh, MCRP increase, you can see that APOE4, uh, in APOE4 brains, uh, microcapillaries lens significantly decreased, followed by uh, APOE3 and APOE4, but not, but the capillary lens in APOE2 brains are not, uh, was not affected by peripheral um, uh, MCRP. Another thing is here you can see, um, CD31 and MCRP binding negatively correlated with microvessel lens, suggesting this kind of binding is, a, uh, is really cause uh, cerebral vascular damage and auxiliary uh, pathology. Okay, we also uh, 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 show that peripheral increase the peripheral MCRP increase T lymphocyte translocation from blood into the brain only in APOE4 mice. Here you can see um, this is CRP, uh, PBS treatment. This is uh, MCRP treatment. Uh, this, uh, these are T lymphocyte markers, either CD8 or CD3. You can see APOE4 brain significantly increased but not in APOE3 uh, or APOE2 mice or wild type mice. Um, these really uh, uh, statistically significant. We also found here is a, we also show that peripheral MCRP increased neuroinflammation. You can see that compared to PBS treatment, MCRP increased CD68 and IBA1 only in APOE4 mice but not in APOE2 and or APOE3 mice. We also uh, uh, conducted immunostaining of tau opposite, again, after elevating uh, uh, MCRP in blood uh, peripherally, the uh, only APOE4 mice increased tau opposite. This is a PHF1. Uh, staining, but not, again, not in APOE2 or APOE3 mice. Um, this is cortex and this is hippocampus. Again, you can see MCRP treatment significantly increased um, uh, tau opposite in, um, in APOE4 mice. So as the next step, we want to further investigate whether MCRP bind the CD31 in brain endothelial cells. Uh, what we did is we isolated an endothelial cells from the brain, and then we added MCRP and, and then uh, did immunostaining. So you can see uh, uh, primary uh, endothelial cells uh, bind uh, MCRP here, and CD31 staining here, they really bind each other. This is PLASA, 
and, and also co-localized. And there is also uh, PC, uh, uh, CD31, also more of them phosphorylated after MCRP uh, added. Another experiment we did, we used SIR, siRNA to inhibit expression of CD31 of endothelial cells. So you can see it's quite effective they uh, knock down the expression of CD31. And then after we knock down the binding of MCRP to uh, CD31 also dramatically decreased, uh, which is shown here. This is uh, without knockdown, this is knockdown of MCRP. So I think this experiment really is suggesting that CD31 is a key element uh, receptor to bind MCRP during peripheral chronic uh, 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 inflammation. We, uh, after we uh, injected uh, IP injection of MCRP, we isolated uh, endothelial cells from brain and then we conducted RNA sick. We did analysis. We found um, APOE and CD31 involved in three pathways, vasculature development, leukocyte migration, and the RAS protein signal transduction. And these pathways after uh, peripheral MCRP increase uh, treatment in APOE2, they're increased these uh, 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 blue uh, uh, green bars. However, in APOE3 and APOE4 brains, uh, endothelial cells, they're decreased. So they're in the opposite direction. And this slide shows we also, uh, we also did human uh, brain study uh, compared to this is, uh, these are control brains and these are AD brains. And then we did immunostaining of, um, uh, of these brains. So you can see that AD brains has significant uh, immunostaining of MCRP compared to the controls, almost nothing. And this, uh, these are CD31, you can see blood vessel structure and MCRP and CD31 co-localized, more of them co-localized in AD brains compared to almost nothing in control brains. Uh, and panel B shows, again, AD brains, more of them, uh, they have more PCD31 staining compared to, uh, compared to normal brains. And the other thing is uh, when we also measure the uh, microvascular uh, lens uh, and AD brains uh, is significantly uh, shorter than, um, than the control brains. This slide shows, uh, in contrary, those uh, control brains, they have higher level of APOE proteins and APOE proteins also co-localized with uh, CD31 and they are also bind. They can bind because PLA assay shows um, they more of them uh, CD31 and APOE bind more in control brains uh, compared to AD brains, almost nothing here. So it's the opposite. In AD brains, uh, more CD31 and MCRP binding. In control brains, more um, CD31 and APOE binding. And we uh, uh, went back to the APOE Naki mice again after MCRP treatment you can see, um, and then we did PLA assay, you can see opposite in APOE2 brains, more of them have um, APOE CD, uh, CD31 APOE binding, but um, uh, uh, not difference in APOE3 and APOE4 mice. We also found that MCRP CD31 binding Negative, negatively correlated with APOE CD31 binding. So in summary, uh, this is a working hypothesis. Uh, often clinically, I know that many clinicians have noticed a lot of elderly people 
um, that when they either have inflammation like operation or like previous speakers is pneumonia, uh, UTI, and their cognition uh, rapidly declines. Some of them, not all of them. And in one or two years, some of them develop Alzheimer's disease. So we think that's a really um, MCRP bind CD31 in APOE4 mice probably, and this binding um, uh, cause vascular cerebrovascular damage uh, and auxiliary pathology, leading to neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration, um, and also T cell migration to uh, to cause a neuroinflammation. So, um, however, in APOE2 my, uh, in APOE2 carriers, more APOE2 proteins bind CD31. Uh, that's why when they have inflammation, MCRP would not be able to bind to CD31 easily on endothelial cells. That's the reason that APOE2 brain um, are protected. So I want to really thank pe people in, uh, in my team, especially Dr. Chu Shan Tao, who conducted mainly the human uh, 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 data analysis, and also Dr. Linda Zhang, who uh, did mainly did the experiments on MCRP and APOE mice. Both of them have great enthusiasm uh, for scientific discoveries. And this is acknowledgement uh, of this study. Uh, I think is really, uh, this is a true multidisciplinary study. And, um, and B, uh, Boston University is a very supportive and collaborative uh, environment. A lot of people involved uh, in, uh, in this study. And another speaker who is also uh, um, uh, from our, uh, from, uh, is my collaborator is Dr. Xiaoling Zhang. So I want to thank them. Thank you so much, Dr. Q. Uh, we are so grateful for your presentation and for your time here today. And also grateful to Rhoda Ao for introducing us uh, to you also and to Xiaoling. Um, we have a question in the chat um, from Dr. Alberi, and it is, do you see small infarcts in APOE4 brains as a consequence of microvessel collapse? Um, well, uh, I uh, you, we all, in our experimental uh, design, we only treat the mice six months and three days per week because we want to mimic the um, like episodic uh, inflammation uh, uh, situation in humans. Um, we didn't, we, the only thing we saw is, uh, I think is quite significant is a uh, capillary lens is shorter. Um, at least we didn't, we didn't observe any uh, like hemorrhage or any uh, stroke in fact, that kind of, uh, but we, I have to admit, we also didn't specifically search for that. Thank you. So uh, we have another question in the chat and is, do you see the accumulation of MCRP also in peripheral organs in APOE4 carriers? We didn't, uh, we didn't do that, we didn't, uh, but however, MCRP was quite um, studied a lot for cardiovascular disease. It is definitely have been shown uh, it is deposited in peripheral blood vessels, especially atherosclerosis. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else from the group have questions? Lavinia, do you have your hand up or is it a uh, thumbs up? <laughs> yes, sorry. It's, okay. a, it's both. <laughs> okay. I, I, I love this, um, I myself, but we can discuss this in the, in the panel uh, maybe later. But uh, I really uh, like this idea very much of peripheral uh, inflammation potentially being 
um, uh, high risk for for the development of neurodegeneration. Um, I was wondering whether we should all take a uh, recombinant apoe. <laughs> <laughs> if we have low chronic inflammation, because it seems the APOE uh, displaces MC, um, MCRP. Yeah, I I really uh, think like previous uh, speaker also talk about uh, multiple infection, right? From the studies, from recent public publications, we also see a lot of different infectious agents uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease. I really, uh, I started this study was because my clinical observation, as I said, you know, I saw many um, uh, elderly patients, they were fine, you know, but after you, you hear from the, um, the family before the surgery or before pneumonia, before the UTI, they were fine. But after that, um, mom or dad, uh, uh, memory declines rapidly. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, we do so value those clinical observations, right, as they can be incredibly valuable clues to fuel and furnish research projects, um, which is which is incredibly valuable. So thank you again, Dr. Q, so much for your thank time. You. Uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, go on to our last speaker for this first session, um, and Dr. Q's colleague, uh, Dr. Zhao Ling Zhang. Uh, I hope I'm doing your name its proper justice. Um, Dr. Zhang is an MD PhD and an associate professor of medicine in biomedical genetics at the Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, and today, she will be speaking about midlife lipid and glucose levels being associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Dr. Zhang, it is wonderful to have you here. And when you are ready, I will turn it over to you to go ahead and share your slides. Sure, thank you very much for inviting me to present our study in this symposium. And um, can you see my slides? It looks like they're on their way. Yes, okay. we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. As uh, Dr. Chi mentioned, that we are working together as a large team to uh, study not just molecular mechanism, but also studying the uh, epidemiology risk factor associated with AD by leveraging this uh, uh, very unique, large, um, old, <laughs> I wouldn't say old, but very longitudinal, famous uh, female heart study cohorts. Especially two years ago, uh, Dr. Lindsay Farrell and Rod O uh, initiated this uh, female heart study brain aging program uh, at Boston University. That uh, gave us a lot of opportunity to study um, known or unknown risk factor associated with AD. So I will skip this slide because everybody know or remember this, but I want to emphasize this one APOE4 genetic risk factor. Uh, as for late onset uh, AD disease, APOE4 is the common genetic risk factor with the frequency is 15% in the population, in, in the uh, European ancestry population. And uh, the reason why we study this um, as you know, um, measures of vascular and metabolic disease, uh, we are established risk factor for late onset AD. Uh, for example, in, in 2019, we could research reported that circulating cholesterol level uh, associated with AD risk. And also in 2017, uh, in this 3 c study, they, this 3 study is a longitudinal population-based prospective cohort study. Uh, it's similar to female study, uh, but where I will mention female study is, is unique in the, later, in the next slide. So in this study, we report that the plasma measured the lipid level uh, <clears throat> with incident dementia and the dementia subtypes. Also, um, uh, other cardiovascular risk factors like uh, hypertension, BMI, diabetes, are uh, also report to associated AD. So however, uh, it is very, um, it is still uh, poorly understood whether exposure to this risk factor in early stage, in early adulthood, is associated with AD later in life. So uh, I just, um, we want to uh, we ask this question 
uh, this safety risk factor associated with the incident of AD, incident, incidence of AD in a female heart study. Uh, as a female heart study has longitudinal measured this uh, all uh, kinds of CVD risk factors. And we they also have follow-up clinical AD diagnosis. So uh, here is the female heart study. Mm, uh, it, the female study originally cohort was initiated in when it was initiated in 1948, and there are 32 exams uh, completed already for exam for original cohort, which has 5,000 more than 5,000 subjects. In 1971, and they initiated the offspring cohorts. So far, there are 10 exams already completed for offspring cohorts, and they also have 5,000 subjects. Uh, in 2002, um, almost yeah, 10, 20 years ago already. The generation three cohort initiated the four thousand more than four thousand subjects, and now I think uh, already uh, exam three already completed. Uh, exam four is already studied as well. So you can see that a lot of um, not just a lot of cardiovascular risk factor uh, measured longitudinally across this time time points for each subject, and uh, also uh, uh, clinical diagnosis or disease and other dementias also available. And uh, we would like to leverage this data sets, especially we focus on offspring cohorts, which has the most comprehensive uh, risk factor measured. Also they reach the age for dementia. So we get a, um, we get a reasonable number of uh, Osama dementia diagnosis comparing to younger population generating three cohorts. So in this study, we focus on offspring cohorts. So in, as I mentioned, uh, they studied the uh, AD for the offspring cohort, they studied the uh, AD follow-up in 1976. And uh, we, uh, when we do this analysis, we that time in the AD follow-up is the last time is the last day of 2017. And uh, recently they released the new, newly diagnosed uh, AD diagnosis information, in, I think this year, there are more data available. So um, as a, this is the number of the participants with instant AD cases at each exam for Framingham offspring cohorts. So I mentioned from, the, you can see from exam cycle one to 10, we have the, there are number of 10 days. When you follow up recently, uh, you can imagine there are less more participants can get in. And then their age range is from, um, is broad, for each exam, just why I say uh, the for late onset or some disease cases, this is a very good uh, uh, cohort to exam because we get a reasonable number of eight cases from this community based cohorts, and uh, you can say the number of incident cases at each exam. We can say totally there. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. And uh, since we also include education in the uh, in the uh, in our analysis, so we exclude the uh, seven hundred two participants. We don't they don't have the education information, and uh, ten about ten eight cases they don't have age at onset. We also exclude that those from the analysis, and uh, we did not include exam ten. What I need the seventeen eight cases here because uh, we in our whole analysis we. We use the end of the day, uh, December 31, um, 2016. So um, this is the overall study design. Um, I, we we um, propose two study, two analysis. One is we analyze each exam at one by one because at the time at each exam, each at, if you treat each exam as a baseline, they are uh, um, risk factor, those exposure measured at exactly the same time. And um, then we was to compare to another study uh, because at each exam, the subjects are not at the same, same age group. So we use a second strategies to we combine exam two, exam one, and exam two to early adulthood, which in majority is from 35 to 50 years old. And we also, and then exam two, three, four subjects, those subjects between 51 to 60 years old, we define as middle, middle adulthood. And uh, exam four to five, six, uh, for those uh, group to the later adulthood, those age from 61 to 6, 71 years old. The reason we do this, not just balance the um, age group, 
but we also balance the number of AD instance at uh, each age group. So we hope to use these two different uh, study design to give us the uh, give us the um, the, the, the exact risk factor at the different exam different age group. They are in fact uh, with the AD instance. So we uh, we treat the risk factor measured at each exam as baseline, and we analyze them separately at the outcome of each instance. And secondly, we use each age group treated as baseline and analyzed separately for each age group. And this is the um, just the uh, basic characteristics for each the subject in each age group. Uh, you can see, as I mentioned before, the age in the early adulthood mean age is 41, and uh, in the middle age, middle age group, the mean age is 54, and uh, late, late adulthood is middle mean age is 64 years old. And uh, female proportion percentage in each group is similar, like 51 to 52 percent. And uh, education level, you can say, um, is uh, is a little different but still very comparable across these three different groups. And the follow-up year, you can see, uh, of course, the early adulthood has much longer follow-up, 31 years old. And then the middle age group has 26, and the late, onset, late adulthood has 18 years old. So this is the advantage of the female heart study. As I mentioned for those um, others, study look at uh, cardiovascular risk factor with AD or other measures. On um, average, their follow-up time is 10 years old uh, because they started to uh, they recruit those subjects in older, in, uh, adult, they started to recruit those old participants to follow up for less than 10 years. They can get a reasonable number of 80 cases in their studies. But at the same time, we can follow up uh, 30, over 35 years old. And also you can say 80 instance in each age group is was also similar. And uh, then we, in our study, we have APOE genotype as well measured. And we also have different uh, cardiovascular risk factors measured. And you can see LDL cholesterol level, HDL cholesterol level, triglycerol rate, and the total cholesterol rate, and also blood glucose and blood pressure. And we also studied uh, BMI and uh, smoking, and also um, and uh, smoking and BMI and uh, other cardiovascular related risk factors, but I did not mention here because those results are, are lacking. So we put in this, we did, I did not mention here. And in addition, um, as in the, in the female study, those subjects, if they have diagnosis, they were also treated for diabetes and were also treated for hypertension, were also treated for dyslipidia. So we also uh, adjust for this treatment in our analysis. And this is the method that we use. Uh, as you, we use, we define the instant AD and occur after age 60. And uh, as I mentioned already, we analyze those uh, risk factors one by one across three age groups, early onset, mid, uh, early adulthood, mid adulthood, and late adulthood. And uh, we use the Cox proportion hydration regression model for instant AD in each age group, also for at each age exam. And uh, we tested the uh, um, Three model at uh, the base model, we uh, in this Cox model, eight incidents and in the outcome were just for age, sex, and education because we, which are no uh, uh, factors for AD. And then in model two, beyond age, sex, education, we added uh, adjusted further for risk factor specific treatment, as I mentioned. And then in model three, we also adjusted for APOE4 carrier status because APOE4 is the common genetic risk factor in the onset of Lyme disease. And uh, I just briefly show this result. Mm. Uh, as you can see, uh, in this, uh, as in each row is for each exam. We analyze exam one to seven. And uh, for a number of events, uh, you can see um, exam one has a more number of 80 case incidents. When um, then with the number of incidents decrease when in the later uh, exam. For the HDL, you can see the p-value is significant in the exam one and exam two, also exam six and seven. And uh, triglyceride is uh, significant in exam one and also exam, um, exam um, six, seven. And uh, for the 
this is for the um, dis dystonic blood pressure. Dystonic blood pressure, uh, the reporting, previous literature reported is uh, blood pressure was associated with AD, but in our study for, you can see at e every exam, exam one to nine, we did not observe what um, significant association between AD. And however, for the glucose, you can see, is a very significant at each exam, from exam one to exam nine, especially in the exam four and the exam exam four and the five and the six. And this is the study for each exam, as I see, and in the glucose level and the hippocampus level. No, sorry, a glucose level and the high HDL level are highly significant associated with AD instance. And then and the second study is we, as I mentioned, we separate those uh, sub subjects into early adulthood and middle adulthood and late, late adulthood. Uh, similar, you can see HDL level uh, is the uh, p-value less than 0.05 in the early adulthood, and the p-value is 0.01 in the middle, middle adulthood, but not a significant in the later stage, later stage age. And uh, for uh, triglyceride level is a significant in early state, early adulthood, but not in the middle and the <clears throat> late adulthood. And the glucose level is a different story. Glucose level, uh, what is significant in the exam one, two, but uh, not in the early adulthood uh, group. And is a very significant p value is 2.3 uh, multiplied 10 minus 4 in the uh, middle adulthood group, and uh, not significant in middle adulthood. And uh, for the um, Dystonic blood pressure, uh, it, is, it is only uh, marginally significant in late adulthood. So this is, uh, uh, I would like to use, uh, similar to what we found in the, uh, each exam results, that HDR is significant in early and mid adulthood, but uh, uh, glucose is only significant associated with AD, mostly very significant associated with AD in the middle adulthood. And you, if you look at the hydro ratio here, and the glucose level, the hydro ratio is uh, 0 0.85, which means if you higher lower lower level HDL, the you will have higher risk of AD. And for the glucose, blood glucose level, H and uh, hydro ratio is 0 0.15, 1.15, which means if you have higher glucose level, you have higher risk of AD instance in your late life. So what what so here is the um, survival curve for um, for blood glucose level, this is showing the middle uh, in early uh, early early stage, uh, early adulthood. We separate in the left panel. We separate those uh, separate those uh, separate the subject by the blood glucose level into three groups. One is less than 100. Second one is between 100 and 125, and the last group is the larger than 126. You can see in this uh, p value is significant. And on the right panel, we separate into two groups. One is less than 100, which is, can be, you can see, is a pre-diagnostic pre group. And uh, that's clearly more significant, and p value is less than 0.01. And uh, similarly, in the middle of that code, uh, the, we can see that the p value is significant, and we can, uh, the AD instance uh, is different between these uh, two or three groups, by separated by the blood glucose, glucose level. And however, you can see in the low data code is the p value is not significant for, uh, which means in, the, in your later, uh, when people participate age, age, age like between 61 and 70 years old, their AD instance is not different between this, uh, this two or three groups so, uh, defined by the blood books levels. And uh, the summary, uh, and, uh, so we can see, um, uh, uh, a 15 milligram increase in high density lipid HDL, which is a higher lipid, uh, high thick lipid good 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 glucose level, which is associated with the decreased AD risk during early and middle life, and a uh, uh, 15 milligram increase in glucose level measured during middle adulthood uh, was associated with a 14 percent increased AD risk. Um, we we uh, include the treat, risk factor specific treatment in the model. This association are attenuated but still significant. And uh, to our knowledge, this is the first evidence of the association of AD with decreased HDL level. 
and also increased fasting, fasting groups that were measured in cognitive normal individuals during early to middle adulthood. And uh, we, our findings suggested that carefully management of cholesterol level and the glucose level beginning early adulthood can lower AD risk. And uh, uh, in the model we are adjusting for APOE4, uh, only glucose measured in middle adulthood and uh, triglyceride level measured in early adulthood remains significant. And uh, this is, uh, as we study um, GY study, genome-wide uh, genome uh, genome associate study for lipid level, we know APOE4 is also, um, also, uh, uh, risk, also genetic risk uh, low side for triglyceride level and uh, LDL, low, cholesterol, low density cholesterol level. So this low side, the APOE locus is also longevity low side. So this low side is, is a complicated. Um, they are maybe also uh, has a common or shared genetics between the APOE and the other, um, other phenotypes, including lipids. So there are lots of things we need to do, including genetics, uh, epidemiology, and also molecular mechanism to study this low side with Alzheimer disease and then other vascular risk factor and metabolic disease for this low side. And uh, the association with the glucose in later adulthood becomes significant when APOE4 uh, was included in the, in the model. And uh, this is what we find in this, uh, this preliminary study. And uh, our this work published this year in Alzheimer's dementia uh, received a lot of media attention. And, uh, and uh, the future work we would like to test uh, longitudinal change of risk factor for AD instance. Because in, re in, this, uh, in, the, in the results I presented here, we just treat each time point separately or each group, each group uh, different, uh, separately. But uh, we can leverage the longitudinal change of risk factor uh, at a measured at the Femham study to test their change for AD incidence in later life. We can also test whether this risk factor are causal. Uh, as I just mentioned before, we only use the Cox regression model to test the association between risk factor with AD instance. But we still don't know whether this risk factor are causal, uh, causal or not. So we can leverage the genetic study we, uh, have been, uh, we, uh, we are working on in our group to apply statistic uh, statistics model, including modernization to test whether the summer risk factors are causal for AD instance. We also can test other CVD cardiovascular risk factors measured in the Freeman study with AD risk. AD risk, also uh, cognitive regression, progression, and the brain structure changes also measured at the Freeman study for the same subject. And another thing we want to mention is our group also involved in this NIH, NIA, uh, Ozammer disease sequence project, also Ozammer disease sequencing uh, project function genomics consortium. And uh, now those cohorts have a large number of AD cases and the control, balance control. However, uh, the clearly vascular risk measurements in those cohorts are not very standardized as what uh, we show here at the Femihama study. But now uh, ongoing project like Ozammer disease sequence project, Phenotype phenotype harmonization group they are, uh, now harmonize several cardiovascular risk factors, also other um, social social um, social uh, life lifestyle, etc. So then we can leverage those data, genetic data, whole genome sequence genetic data with all this exposure at um, risk factor to study this relationship or causal effect between. Um, risk factor with AD or cognitive progression as well. And uh, I would like to thank Tong Tong, our PhD student, um, who did all this analysis in this project. As I also mentioned, this study was supported by this large U19 project uh, initiated two years ago by Rhoda, Rhoda and uh, Dr. Farrell, uh, which is also called uh, Femi Maha Study Brain Age Program. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang, for your presentation. We really appreciate your time and uh, we appreciate the work that you're doing. And now um, I can address some questions. Lavinia, it looks like you have your hand raised. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for, for providing this uh, overview of, uh, of your study, very interesting. Um, I'm wondering whether there is this, there is a convergence of uh, uh, vascular disease and uh, AD uh, in, in those individuals where there is a higher glucose and, and triglyceride level at midlife, so. And yeah, this maybe yeah. Dr. Xu can say more. We observed that a uh, female mm -hmm. study, this uh, brain aging program, uh, those part uh, female participants, uh, they, when they die, they also donate the brain to this uh, female study um, program. So for those roughly 200 brain, um, now we are doing the, uh, they have the clear neuropathologic diagnosis. And uh, also, BUADRCA brain bank, we observe, um, I don't know the percentage, maybe 20% of Alzheimer's dementia also have the vascular dementia pathology. And uh, now this is why we go back to check those uh, live participants at the female study to look at those uh, vascular related or metabolic disease related uh, risk factor with AD in later life to see whether we can prevent or early intervention, have early intervention for those subjects. But uh, I know the molecular mechanism, we, we do not know, know that, but recently um, the NIA initiated this Alzheimer disease, second, AD Alzheimer disease sequence project, a functional genomic consortium. One of these projects to look at vascular, um, vascular, uh, vascular role in the, the AD. You see in single nuclear anesthetic data, also using this uh, anophilial uh, isocyte microglial uh, 3D organoid model to estimate the, to examine the molecular mechanism underlying this vascular uh, role in dementia. So a lot of work going on, but uh, as I, from, I can only say from statistics and uh, genetic point of view, especially APOE4 uh, loci, we know is uh, lipids loci as well. Mm -hmm. And is, uh, uh, well, is also the most uh, significant uh, genetic risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Yes. But then their interaction, their role, we are still working on that. Yeah, I was. Yeah, because I mean, when you when you defined AD, uh, I was wondering whether the conversion, I mean, in terms of cognitive deficit, uh, was done in, uh, on the base of of, uh, of the behavior or also uh, in the pathological examination. So, oh, for the for the AD incidents I present here, they are just clinically diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, those surviving people, but after they die, some participants donate the brain to the mm -hmm. brain bank. So we can cross back check to them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, in ter in terms of the uh, of the population, AD is more represented than vascular. But yes, I agree. I mean, we see a lot of uh, um, intersection between AD and vascular, and there it's uh, it's a lot of mixed pathology. Yeah, we recently have another project for the single leukemic for uh, roughly thirty AD brains. Within this 30 AD brain, we find uh, half of them is, uh, has a water vascular dementia. We identify a specific subgroup of endothelial cells uh, only enriched in the AD plus vascular dementia, not with in other AD plus Lewy body, AD plus uh, uh, yeah, Lewy body dementia. Now, yeah, definitely they are unique, some population, cell population there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And see if we have any other questions. Well, I actually have a, a question, but maybe it's more of a thought um, as you present your data and the, um, you know, sort of the overlap uh, between some of the different conditions uh, that are associated also with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. I think about um, certain microbes that have the ability to induce a state of insulin resistance which is a very fascinating thing, Brian, right? Such as the chlamydial organism can do this. And then also the story between atherosclerosis, which is linked to, um, you know, obviously lipids, 
uh, but also then linked to infectious agents. So it'd be very interesting to look at your work, or I guess I should say the work going on at Boston University, um, sort of try to dovetail that a little bit perhaps and discuss uh, later offline the possibility of collaborating around some of the microbial infections that may be a part of this trifecta, if you will, or maybe it's more of a pentagon. <laughs> So let's see, if no one else has any um, direct questions, we can move into uh, the panel discussion. And uh, unfortunately, Dr. Perry had to jump off the call uh, and Dr. Q had to jump off the call because it's very, very late in China. Uh, so it will be uh, Dr. Balin, Dr. Alberry, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Zhang, uh, we can just have a, you know, perhaps a nice discussion um, about some of the things that were discussed today, and then perhaps even how they relate to one another, because they really do, it's sort of like a tapestry. Yeah. Um, I just had uh, still a question for uh, Brian uh, from, from, from the audience, and uh, it was uh, uh, for, for, from your study, did you observe whether chlamydia was entrapped uh, into amyloid aggregation, uh, endosfactory epithelium on, or on the OB? or other brain structures, and uh, whether this could be causative of the chemosensory deficit. Yeah, and you know, and, and what we've found for the most part is that you have a cellular infection with chlamydia, and it's not so much in the, um, in the deposits that are showing up in an extracellular fashion. What we've also found is that the chlamydial infection isn't necessarily in the neurons that contain tangles. And, and we think that, that the, the result of the infection, the inflammation and um, the, the activation of the amyloid cascade pathway of actually generating amyloid is actually creating the scenario of progression of damage um, along the neural pathways. So that early on, for instance, um, you're gonna get synaptic changes, which have been found in Alzheimer's disease as being one of the early structural changes, uh, possibly because of the insult of, of neurons uh, that are nearby to areas where you have infection. And the infection could be in glial cells, but also the neurons. And we think that if the infection, as, as the infection progresses and cells actually will die over periods of time, that's variable though, as to how long it takes for a cell actually to die after being infected. But when the glial cells respond, we think that's the key to now activating uh, all these cytokines that are now damaging your nearby cells, leading to, to those nearby cells actually starting to show signs of uh, synaptic change. Eventual uh, amyloid starts to, it's still soluble, but it starts to accumulate in the nearby environment. And you get a later change of tau formation because of damage to nearby neurons, often through amyloid initiated uh, binding to rage receptors, activation of calcium cascades, et cetera, leading to kinase activity, and then the tau hyperphosphorylation events. So, so it's, it's interesting because it seems like this, these infectious agents can be the initiators of the process, and then the pathology is downstream from those processes. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree uh, that there is a kind of common mechanism and, uh, and, and maybe this, this lead could be, could be leading to early um, chemosensory changes that we observe. Yes, and, yeah. and, and, and one of the important things that we really have focused on is that it's the limbic system that really is being affected early on. And the question mark has always been, why is it the limbic system? Why is the endorhinal cortex? Why is it the hippocampal formation? There's been a lot of hand waving about why that is. A lot of people have just jumped right to the blood brain barrier and said, well, it's a blood brain barrier issue. 
But the question becomes, why the blood-brain barrier in that particular region of the brain? Those, mm -hmm. those blood-brain barrier cells are, uh, have tight junctions, have a lot of expression of proteins, etc. That barrier there is very similar to a barrier elsewhere in the brain, other than for the circumventricular organs, where you have leaky vessels, but tight junctions between your epithelial cells for the choroid plexus and your ependymal cells lining the ventricular system, uh, like more in the third ventricle area uh, of the brain, the endocrine part of the brain. Mm -hmm. so, so other than that part of the brain, all this other blood-brain barrier endothelial cells are very, very similar. So why would the disease start in the hippocampus and that Toronto cortex if it's the blood-brain barrier that's first being damaged mm -hmm. and giving you that specificity? That is not well explained. What is better explained is if you have a pathway in from a nerve, a, a cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve, into the specific area of the brain that is earliest damage in Alzheimer's disease and in some of these other diseases too, like frontotemporal dementias, Pick's disease, uh, Lewy body disease, etc. You have specificity, selective vulnerability of those regions due to these types of insults. Now, uh, not all organisms will go in this way. Um, not not uh, all uh, toxins uh, will affect this, but we have enough evidence with COVID and COVID-2, with some of these other infectious agents many of us have been studying for years, that you can affect this specific pathway in a very specific manner, bypassing the blood-brain barrier. So, so the question becomes, it's not that the blood-brain barrier is not important, it's very important, but it's probably a secondary issue to what's really happening initially in brain tissues. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. Um, and I, I just to come back to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Q uh, talk also, uh, I find it fascinating that uh, there is this uh, association between CRP and metabopathy, and we know very well that uh, the, uh, the progression of tau pathology follows the olfactory route. So in some sense, I mean, it's a lot of uh, correlation, correlation is not causation, but it could be uh, a waterfall of events that then altogether cause um, inflammation and inflammation uh, causes more amyloid to be released uh, due to base uh, upregulation. So, um, I think those uh, those agents that, uh, or at least those those events, those uh, repetitive events that we face during our lifetime, uh, that uh, could expose us to pathogens or um, a disbalance in, uh, as we as we heard in our uh, metabol metabolism, could then lead to alteration in, uh, in inflammation and, and, and kind of reaction, overreaction from, from our nervous system. Sure. And the other thing I think is that, you know, we've been, we've been shown evidence and others have, have found evidence that in highly polluted rest, uh, these are now highly air polluted areas, that small particulate matter that gets in through your olfactory pathways mm -hmm. will give you a very similar outcome yeah. as we would see with anything affecting that pathway and giving you inflammation in the brain. Uh, so, so there's evidence in a number of different uh, ways that we have that respiration is a big issue here, olfactory trafficking into the brain is a big issue. Um, and, and accessory issues as well, obviously. Gut microbiota is a big issue as well, <laughs> and what the gut and how that's changing and how that can influence outcomes as well. So, so it, it is a complicated issue, uh, but it's one where we have to start accepting that there are certain ingredients that can actually, we're, we're pushing the envelope forward by these different ingredients actually now creating the scenario for disease. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe uh, I'm. I'm just. Uh, I don't want to take too much of the stage. Maybe Nikki or, or Professor Zhang, uh, you have any question or any any points of discussion? Thank you. 
In today's talk, yeah, this infection mass pathogen also the mitochondrial dysfunction, stress, oxidative stress is very interesting. Also, um, mitochondria also highly involved in the metabolic, metabolism disease, metabolic disease. We are also at the film study, we have whole genome sequencing. We are studying mitochondria copy number or mitochondria mutation with those uh, uh, risk factor was the cognitive function and the AD. But uh, when I present that result to the community, some people ask, mitochondria is so important in each cell, each organism. How can you treat AD by knocking down or work on target of mitochondria? <laughs> so uh, I'm not an expert. I just want to, yeah, maybe some people can... <laughs> Well, I don't know how to answer that, <laughs> that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's because mitochondria seems to be the key, so important for each cell. How you design drug targeting mitochondria, or well, it's possible to target mitochondria. Actually, really funny that you bring that up because later today, Dr. Mark Nelson, who's an organic medicinal chemist, is going oh, nice. to talk, he's actually going to talk about this um, with regard, and I won't spoil his spoil what he'll say later, but he'll be talking about um, the impact of uh, tetracycline molecules, but non-antibiotic tetracycline molecules on human mitochondria. Um, so oh, that'll nice. be pretty interesting. And then, you know, um, my one thought of, in all of this is to sort of like aggregate all of the different comments and presentations is just the need for precision which I know we say this over and over again. And I was at the CTAD conference, the clinical trials and Alzheimer's meeting last week in San Francisco. And this was raised, um, you know, alongside uh, the news of the lecanemab trial. Uh, people were also saying and echoing at the very same time, we still need precision. We need to identify what precise drive drivers are there, what are the most predominant ones, and then target those underlying insults, if you will. Um, and one thing that I always like to point out, um, as I'm a bit of a generalist, is if you look up inflammation in the National Library of Medicine, um, and you just, just inflammation, what causes it? What are the most common causes? Number one on the list in medicine is actually infection, followed by mm -hmm. uh, trauma in other physical insults followed by chemical and or contaminant insults, things like UV light, um, other things in the environment. So uh, as we sort of work through different plausible mechanisms and as um, those in the field like Sue Griffin early on have demonstrated that inflammation is key, you know, a key or one of the keys, mm -hmm. um, you know, we think it's sort of critical not just to say, okay, microbes could be involved in the disease, but to really determine which patients have a microbial process ongoing and then what are the microbes? Because as we've heard today, you know, you have the chlamydial organism and Brian, you know, went through and mentioned all of the most commonly associated, but you have all of the herpes viruses, the porphyromonas gingivalis issue that Dr. Truchard raised with the ginger pains. Uh, impacting the brain, the gut microbiota issue, which may be sort of an indirect hit on the brain, not a direct infection process. Um, so if it's if it's highly complex, we have to get down to the process of, okay, thinking about each individual, individual patient as an individual patient and not this blanket approach, which has sort of been the way the field has gone in terms of development over the last three decades. Yeah, I think... Uh... We're all with you, uh, Nikki. I think it's a question also of uh, awareness, and I think uh, since uh, well, we I don't I don't want to say about COVID, but I think this uh, this evidence that you know agents uh, pathogens could effectively have uh, an effect on the brain has just been recently really zoomed in through the COVID pandemic because before it seemed to be something very. I wouldn't say exotic, an evidence, but not enough evidence to uh, to see it, uh, you know, in the making. And I think that now we we have those evidence. And as I said, um, I mean, I was just reading um, subjects who have gone for severe COVID uh, with long term COVID uh, and uh, eventually died. Uh, they um, 
they have a, a, a very similar pathology to Alzheimer. Their brain looks very similar. They might not have developed enough amyloid aggregation, uh, but they are biosimilar to Alzheimer's brain. So I, I think uh, this, this concept that um, agent-induced uh, inflammation could then cause uh, either entry uh, through uh, the, the nasal tract uh, into the brain of, of those agents and then uh, kind of triggering an inflammatory response or vice versa, probably an older individual who could be also a permeability of the blood-brain barrier. I think all this evidence uh, really are out there now for us to start and 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 you know attract more attention and more more investment in this direction to effectively do strata and and from strata and better diagnostic with them can probably uh, start with with some uh, repurposing. I would say, uh, and then also developing new drugs. We have a question from Dr. Trichard. Yes, so on, on mitochondrial function, what we can do about it. First off, there's a long list of supplements like resveratrol that relate to mitochondrial health. So you can look at that lifestyle list. Also, there's known uh, um, complex one Toxins, uh, for example, the famous story of the Guam bat, uh, bats that <clears throat> ate these uh, that were eaten by the local people, and these guys got Alzheimer's. So there's definitely a role in mitochondria and particular factors that help or hurt the, the mitochondria's health in terms of Alzheimer's. Thank you. And I, I would like probably to bring up this, this, um, this intersection between metabolism and inflammation, uh, and maybe a little bit on the uh, insulin resistance story. Maybe Brian, you can kind of elaborate on, on the properties of chlamydia that probably is a good example, right, of this. Uh, it's, it's true. Um... You know, uh, in general, uh, and, and this is something that's not well appreciated unless you're studying infectious diseases per se, is that um, insulin resistance is a common feature of individuals that have developed chronic infections. And that insulin resistance is that you're making insulin, but the receptors for insulin are not really being utilized for uptake so that you're not really utilizing glucose uh, the way that you should be. And in the brain, we know that glucose utilization is becoming a big, is a big issue uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And uh, when the early pets, uh, early, yeah, a uh, PET scanning was done for deoxyglucose uptake, uh, you would find all the cold spots where hippocampus formation, parietal lobe, uh, other parts of the temporal lobe, et cetera. And the question became, are those, uh, is it evidence that the cells are dead or are they not utilizing glucose uh, properly? And is it an insulin issue? Is it a receptor issue, et cetera? And uh, we still ask that question today, actually, as to exactly what's happening in Alzheimer's. Obviously, some people had started calling Alzheimer's type three uh, diabetes because of that. And um, I, I think that we're, we've missed factors that can cause change in the ability of receptors to actually now be bound by insulin and allow for glucose uptake, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, um, that's, that's a factor, I think, with the chlamydial infection and other infections as well uh, that, that people have developed over time. Yeah, I just remember uh, this paper where there was uh, uh, the, the evidence that ID uh, would uh, increase, the, so the reduction of ID would increase the base uh, expression just transcriptionally. I think this is a... Uh, I mean, we always ask uh, why is, you know, why right, there is right. a switch, why there is a switch. And it's happening, uh, and I think this is really looking at triggers. Uh, this could be the maybe the missing link. 
Yeah, and, and I agree with you. I, I, yeah, I didn't mention the insulin degrading enzyme either, but the, the IDE is a big issue there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and why would that be occurring? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and, and I think that probably this and, and, and this propeller, uh, I mean, as we said, it's uh, probably not everyone here in this audience will agree, but uh, amyloid is part of the story causative on some sense in terms of synaptic uh, and you know the effect on, on synaptic uh, plasticity and, and we know it uh, I mean the, the, the oligomeric uh, stickiness is certainly not good but um, what comes first maybe it's not even important what comes first but we certainly need to stop those processes which are snowballing uh, in the brain and uh, probably uh, the fact that you have inflammation uh, together with insulin resistance, maybe locally, uh, could then effectively increase base um, base levels. Uh, yes. And so, yeah, I think I, I think that this probably uh, looking at. Uh, I mean, I always had this uh, dream of having, you know, a blood a blood check interpretable, because <laughs> whenever you go to the to the doctor, they always say, ah. You have a little bit too much of this, but it's absolutely okay. And I think really connecting uh, the dots and being able to say, well, well, you probably your your level of inflammation are a little bit too high, and and yet you have a little bit too much glucose, and this <clears throat> sets you to uh, a risk path. Um, you know, just you know interventions at that particular time in your mid uh, adulthood, which uh, I understand we. All are according to the Framingham clinical segmentation um, would be would be a you know would be desirable because uh, then we could definitely um, intervene with uh, I would say with the pre preventative approaches uh, yeah. but to really lower this the risk of the trajectory. So Absolutely, and something I wanted to raise too that's related to all of this is the genetic, uh, I guess, vulnerability, I would put it, of certain individuals that we are aware of that are more susceptible to deleterious effects of infections, which could be ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have, of course, like Brian presented, the majority of the population uh, with evidence on serology uh, by, the, by the age of 75 or by middle to later age during the time period when your risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease increases uh, infected with the chlamydial organism. We know that herpes simplex virus one and two are very common, HHV six and seven very common. Mm -hmm. um, that pigeon javalis is quite common. Um, that uh, you know other pathogens uh, may just like the SARS-CoV-2 story disproportionately affect certain individuals and those things still really remain to be unveiled. But one thing that is is emerging and, and perhaps even more than emerging, but um, already demonstrated, especially with certain pathogens, is APOE4 in and of itself actually dictating vulnerability to some of these infectious agents. So I wanted to raise that. Um, also, the possibility that some of us over or underreact from the host perspective to the infections, meaning, you know, an overreaction or a very robust cytokine or inflammatory response that in and of itself becomes deleterious and damaging. And this brings in a concept which was very, very popular at, I apologize, that's my phone ringing, um, at the CTAD conference, which was this notion of combination therapy. And I'm going to pull in an example from another area of medicine, uh, which is sepsis the management of sepsis, which is systemic infection, right? Where blood and end organs and, and uh, you know, the whole body system is, is impacted by infect an infectious agent or sometimes polymicrobial infections. Um, the way that that is managed is actually to not only mitigate the infection itself and precisely identify what you're dealing with. Uh, and this is what microbiology labs and hospitals and infectious disease specialists do but you can't just get rid of the infection. You also have to address the inflammatory process that's ensuing or the outcomes will still remain very poor. Um, failure to manage either of these two facets, it will result in a less than positive result. And so I think it's possible that if there is a subset 
of patients who are chronically infected or who have a dysbiosis of the gut, let's say, um, that it may be necessary to modulate uh, an inflammatory response, also to modulate something uh, like gl glucose and lipids or to manage those processes simultaneously to also actually impacting the infections themselves. Um, one other thing that I noted earlier too that I wanted to bring up was the issue of Down syndrome in trisomy 21. Those individuals uh, also have are, are known to be incredibly vulnerable to respiratory tract infections particularly. And I've always felt that that's an important uh, data point, you know, and an important thing to understand in the context of the bigger picture um, with regard to the, yes, the genetic risk, but also the risk of exposures disproportionately affecting certain groups more than others, depending by, you know, their, their unique genetics. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for uh, Dr. Zhang, and of course, I, I saw this 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 paper that came out must have been you know what was the reaction of the of the general American population because the metabol metabolic disease uh, <laughs> is very prominent. So I was just uh... oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. We this our yeah got received lots of media report uh, attention. <laughs> Uh, especially in the notice, uh, this uh, HDL, this uh, good lipids yeah. uh, level, uh, is uh, can protect you from AD in your yeah. later life. So gave us some earlier like a uh, personal like a uh, prevention. But in the future, we need as uh, Nikki I just mentioned, uh, we need to further to check their interaction with uh, genetic, especially APOE4, to separate the subject into different groups, to, or even female and uh, female and male. Because we know in female group, their HDL level, uh, normal HDL level is 10 milligrams than males. So yeah, there's a, we haven't done that, but uh, <laughs> that's our next step, yeah, to more precisely separate and uh, the subject group, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I think that uh, definitely we, 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 will, we would like to have a better uh, overview of uh, our status and uh, maybe our fingerprint in terms of uh, biological risk and uh, probably all this, this research that uh, all of you uh, are doing is, is really important towards understanding uh, what, you know, what, what, what would be the risk um, that we can already see in our blood work, but then also what could be effectively um, um, pathogen agents that uh, could impinge on the brain. So, yeah, in the, um, sorry. Yeah, you go ahead. In the relationship between lipids or cholesterol is uh, dementia is known for a long time. Yeah. And recently, yeah, there are several papers in cell or science. They identify um, additional insights between lipidomic, lipidomic, lipid, lipids metabolism with AD, uh, specifically in some exercise or microglia safe cell types in brain. Because in brain, this lipid metabolism is different in, from in, in plasma, peripheral. So they are now attracting more uh, additional attention. I think more attention, I wouldn't say more, but additional attention in cell type specific uh, uh, relationship in brain specifically. So they are, yeah, definitely there are more. I think now uh, at least NIA at the US, they have more uh, resources like uh, uh, epidemiology, like I present here, also have genetics or genome sequencing, also have the uh, functional genomics, including metabolism, gene expression, or proteomics, etc. They can give us this opportunity to link them together to study them together, not just for risk, but for underlying mechanism at each cell type level as well. We have also Thanks. a comment from, from the audience. One shouldn't forget that inflammation and oxidative stress are independent events. Thus will affect also the disease progression, the lipids, protein, and nucleobase oxidation, and then consequences such as collagen functional alteration. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we- Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree, yeah. 
So I think that this was was wonderful, and uh, we there is so much more to do uh, at this point. Huh? <laughs> Just uh, connecting the dots. I mean, before uh, it was kind of difficult to, <laughs> to to do to do any of these dots, and and now we have the opportunity and. Uh, we, I think we we are very much looking forward also to uh, collaborate uh, with uh, with your group uh, with the, with Rodao on the Birmingham study and whether also uh, there is some some evidence for 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 uh, pathogens uh, that may may drive this inflammatory uh, events in the brain. And uh, so we have uh, we are switching sessions and. Uh, so thank you to all the speakers. And sorry, I, I leave the word to Nikki because she's the moderator. So Nick, Nikki, you have one minute. <laughs> oh, thank you. So uh, no, absolutely, Lavinia. No, we're we're. Um, it's been a delight to moderate the session. You know, thank you again for inviting me to do so. Thank you to all of our speakers and to everyone in the audience for the engaging questions and for the really interesting. Uh, data that was presented and it's just all living as you said work to do food for thought um, just finishing with that interest salt research group is always very keen to collaborate if there's anyone that is interested in what work we are doing specifically around the alzheimer's pathobiome as we call it the deleterious microbes please reach out um, and it's my pleasure to just kind of turn it back to lavinia and preparation for session two yeah, so I think we have, thank you, thank you, Brian. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Zhang. Uh, I think, um, Emanuele, if you can uh, switch your screen on, you are the uh, moderator yeah. for the session. Yeah, okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the second session. And first of all, I would like to thank Lavinia for letting me be part of this organization and then try to collaborate as best as I can. So I am happy to present the second session, so therapeutics in clinical trials. In particular, uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Minzer from the University of South California, Car USA. Carolina. Uh, sorry, Car Carolina. Carolina, sorry. And uh, yeah, the title of the talk is uh, about um, lives and benefits and uh, of cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol study. Please, uh, the stage is yours. Can you can you can you hear me? Can yeah. you see me? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Oh, let me see if you can see me now. Can you see me now? Yes. yes. Here you are. Okay. Well, um, so I have to. Can you start? Can I start? Oh, yeah. So, Whenever you're so, ready. Um, so I have. I'm technologically challenged. So I have uh, a colleague of mine that will be uh, sharing the screen and showing the slides. So okay. let me just survey that. Can we start with the first slide? Okay, so so first of all, as disclosures, um, I spent, uh, I learned that over time that it's easier to lose your hair than your accent. So <laughs> feel free to interrupt me with any um, questions. It's sometimes uh, it's a little bit difficult to understand what I said. Um, next slide. Um, I would like to first thank the National Institute on Aging that is supporting this work, uh, the team from the Alzheimer's Research Consortium, uh, and a number of my colleagues that um, helped me to move forward with this very peculiar and, and unique uh, challenge. Next slide. So probably this, I'm a storyteller, so, um, so let me start by that. Uh, let me introduce you, Libby Sofer. Libby Sofer was one a friend, a volunteer, somebody would provide care for. And Libby was a delightful, active, very um, engaging human being, which will complain because the ladies in our research team were using too short of skirts, and she would not be happy with that. But uh, 
Next slide. But this absolutely wonderful human being uh, died in, in the care of Charleston Hospice Care Team. And she received what everybody received, which is alloperidol, valium, and morphine uh, with the, for the treatment of her agitation. Uh, and that didn't work very well, right? Uh, she, uh, she, her agitation, she, the medications, instead of really taking care of the symptoms, um, increase her agitation and confusion, cause her to develop severe pruritus and constipation. In other words, she was scratching all over and miserable. And unfortunately, Libby died in despair. Next slide. And let me, before I go to this slide, let me give you bad news. We are all going to die. And there is absolutely no clinical research program to evaluate medications that will help people through the dying process. As a matter of fact, there is only one double-blind placebo-controlled trial done in this population, not talking about Alzheimer's or people with agitation, but just one study being done, and it showed that placebo was better. So why are we giving these medications, these uh, benzodiazepines, alloperidol, and morphine? Because of tradition, because that's what we always have done, and that's what people keep doing. And every one of my palliative care doctors will say that this drug do my miracle, but we all share the experience of seeing people dying in less than delightful conditions. There are no treatments really guidelines for the management of specifically for agitation in hospice eligible pa patients with agitation and Alzheimer's disease or any other type of dementia. There is a number, the number of people living with Alzheimer's disease and other type of dementia is, ex, expect, is expected to rise a lot. And agitation is a common symptom in the late stages of the disease. And an estimated 50% of the people will die with dementia related causes. And 45% of them, about 80,000 people every year, will die with symptoms of agitation. Next slide. And those of us, that will die from symptoms of agitation, 70% of us will be receiving psychiatric medications with no evidence whatsoever that those work. Common use medications uh, for the management of agitation, as I said, are antipsychotic, but those cause Parkinsonian symptoms, worsening of confusion, sedation, metabolic disturbances, and, and actually, increases the risk of death in, in the wrong way. Benzodiazepines increase the risk of confusion and sedation, and we want our loved ones to be as, as awake as possible in the last few days of their life. So they can be with us and we can share uh, the moments and, and support them through this, through this time. Narcotics, morphine, cause sedation, constipation, severe constipation, pruritus and fall, so, so, the patient, so the dying patient would just be, you know, basically non-stable to do some very basic functions. Next slide. So I thought that I'm a sucker for a good cause, right? And I don't know if we can say those words, but, uh, but I thought that that was wrong. It was wrong that the most common human condition, which is death, we have no research on how to provide help in the process. And we were working based on tradition, knowledge and experience, but not on research. So um, we started to look at what will be the most um, uh, appropriate treatment for this condition. And as we go around, we, uh, and I see we, because there were a number of researchers that were doing similar things at the same time, uh, we found out that THC has a well-documented psychoactive activity. THC activates cannabinoid receptors directly, mainly the CB1. CB1 uh, represses neurotransmitted release in the brain and regulates synaptic transmission. THC exerts a broad effect of the regulation of emotion. 
and has been used and been reported to decrease and modulate anxiety, especially regarding fears of death and agitation related to death. Next slide. CBD actually modulates these effects. CBD is a non-psychoactive component of the marijuana plant. CBD indirectly modulates the receptors, so the, the severe effects that THC have in terms of psychedelic uh, type of effects or delusional type of effects are modulated by the presence of CBD. As I said, CBD opposes then the action of THC and, 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 and manage all these symptoms, and CBD directly activates uh, hydro-C tryptamine uh, which is part of the serotonin receptor and triggers inhibitory responses and slow 5-HT1 signaling that's having positive therapeutic effects on anxiety, appetite, sleep, pain perception, nausea, and vomiting, all symptoms that are extremely relevant during the dying process. Next slide. And I said there is, uh, that when I said we, and I mean a number of researchers, uh, have been starting the process of trying to understand uh, how THC and CBD work. Today, the number of clinical trials have been reported on the impact of cannabinoids in the use in agitation and or aggression. Uh, but the problem with the problem were the numbers and the scope. Uh, for example, some of the studies thought there were 67 people that completed the study. Most of the clinical trials were not done with THC or CBD, but they use uh, synthetic um, uh, versions of the of these, the like dronabino and nabilon, and and a significant portion of the par participants had used si si were using psychoactive medication to manage the symptoms at the time. So it's not clean research. Next slide. So I don't want to go each one of those studies, but you can see that, for example, the study for Embolizer and, and colleagues, it's about 15 patients with Alzheimer's disease. Um, there was no agitation really as a primary outcome. And so it's not extremely helpful. The study by Malberg, where seven patients were diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease, they resulted in uh, in significant reduction in, in nocturnal activities, 16% versus baseline in the active treatment, but they was not extremely well controlled. Next slide. The Van Hazen study uh, did not observe any differences, but again, a small samples, 50 patients. Uh, the Woodward study, um, was uh, the addition of dronabinol correlated with significant decreases in all domains but of agitation, but it was not specifically designed to this group and it were only 40 patients. Next slide. And finally, the study that really the best done study was a study done by Herman and colleagues. It was a randomized placebo controlled trial of Nabilon for agitation and AD. Uh, show that uh, that the drug was effective in, in the treatment of patients with late stage dementia, more similar to what we're looking, specifically suffering from agitation, was a 14 weeks, 39 subjects were randomized. Uh, the primary outcome patient was the Cohen Mansfield agitation inventory, and really just to be very clear, show positive results in the Cohen Mansfield agitation and all the other agitation uh, outcome measures. Next slide. So we decided uh, to try to apply for a large double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And we wanted to use THC and CBD rather than um, uh, that the synthetic product because the, um, the product itself was, support, was reported to have less side effects than the synthetic ones and be more effective. But we got into, but quickly, as we got into the study, we learned very quickly that there were good reasons why people have not done this study before. It's not that they were smarter than anybody else, but the reason that no study has ever been done before is because, you know, I, I don't know you, but 
my dad used to say that he knew I was going places, so he knew he was going places, but he would do much better if he knew where he was actually going to. And in other words, to find an appropriate treatment, what you need is to have a definition of what you're going to treat. And soon enough, we learned that there was no definition for agitation in this peculiar population. So now you're in the problem that you're going to convince a peer review group to give you money to do a study on a condition that this has no definition. The primary outcome, the Cohen Mansfield Agitation Inventory was suggested, but not necessarily validated for this population. How long would you treat a population that is dying? Are you going to treat them for a month, for a week? What if people don't, don't die at the rate you expect or, or they, they die before and then you run out of power? How long should be the study? Are we going to really give placebo to a population that is dying? Who is going to be in the study? How, how difficult would it be? How can we, uh, how can we, um, somebody is, I don't know if it's my, my screen or everybody can see this. Oh, here you are. Okay, that's my computer. Uh, so who should be in and who should be out? Should we include all types of dementia? Should we include people that have only Alzheimer's disease? And if that's the case, how are we going to verify that it's only Alzheimer's disease? Are we going to require that we have amyloid in the brain? How are we going to find THC and CBD that will be produced with good manufacturing practices that will be acceptable in a clinical research trial? And how are we going to recruit patients? Next slide, please. So let's go one by one. I will take you to a journey of about a year and a half, two years. Definition of agitation. We work together with the International Psychogeriatric Association to modify the definition of agitation to make special provisions that will allow hospice care eligible patients to be part of the study of the definition. For example, at the core of the definition of agitation in Alzheimer's disease is the elimination of any medical condition that will cause or contribute to the agitation. Well, in our patients, that will not qualify clearly, right? Because most of the patients will have medical conditions that they are going to cause and be part of the symptom of, syndrome of agitation because these patients are dying. Uh, what would be the primary outcome measure? Well, we agree that uh, we will be using the Cohen Mansfield Agitation Inventory because, or mainly because, there is an observable behavior. We didn't want to uh, depend so much on the caregiver uh, judgment of the behavior, but we wanted to deal with things that we can observe, see, and measure. And the Cohen Mansfield Agitation Inventory measures of frequency, but it was not designed for these populations. So we have to do adaptation and validate the adaptation of the Cohen Mansfield agitation inventory for this group. The study duration, there was this feeling that we wanted at least 12 weeks of double blind placebo control, but we didn't know how, how much people will survive. So we decided to do a combination where the primary outcome measure will be at two weeks, but there will be a 12 week double blind for these patients followed by an open label. How we will manage placebo? How we're going to give placebo to a dying group of patients? We decided that we will give to everyone the chance to receive the best possible medical available care. And if the patient still will remain agitated, we will keep them in the, in the medication that they were receiving with the treatment they were receiving, and then either add the uh, treatment, uh, the THC CBD combination or at placebo. We decided to be as open as possible. We decided that in this population, it will not make, make any sense to have a clear uh, restricting inclusion exclusion criteria. So basically, if you have cognitive impairments severe enough to qualify for dementia and you were hospice care eligible and agitated, you're in the study. To find the drug was another issue. I want to shame here publicly manufacturers in the US. 
because we couldn't find any manufacturer in the US that will provide uh, good manufacturing practice uh, compounds that can be uh, used with purified CHC, CBD and THC and that uh, will be um, able to also produce a placebo. And we learn about recruiting methods after talking with lots of our collaborators. The main important reason we learn is that we have to go where the patients are. We cannot expect our patients, of course, to come. And we have to develop a relationship and have investigators that they are actually palliative doctors working in the hospice environment. Next slide. So what was the main goal of Libby was to develop a safe and effective approach for the treatment of hospice care eligible patients with agitation and Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. Next slide. So the resolution, the Levy is a 12 week phase two multi-center randomized double blind parallel group placebo control study with, uh, where we're treating HAD patients, evaluating the efficacy and tolerability of THC and CBD. We, uh, we uh, look at the equivalency of the study by Herman and others. And we decided to go for an eight milligram dose of THC and 400 milligrams of CBD dissolve in digestible oil because this, our patients could not swallow. We, we didn't feel comfortable our patients will be able to swallow a pill. Administer two times a day with a maximum of four milligrams of THC and 200 milligrams of CBD. Uh, the current proposal was, uh, was choose to use THC and CBD oil as we discussed. And we expect we expected to have a very benign side effect profile. Next slide. Then the objective, as I said, was to evaluate the efficacy and tolerability of THC and CBD. And the end point was the coin Mansfield agitation inventory at two weeks. Next slide. Importance though, it's not in the slide, but of interest, we wanted to see how the effects, how the doctors will decide or will think encourage to discontinue the treatment with, uh, with benzodiazepines, haloperidol, and morphine. So we will encourage the doctors, but not oblige the doctors to uh, decrease the traditional treatments if they see that the patient will, is improving uh, in under study medication. Uh, as I said, inclusion criteria is very simple. Next slide. Uh, uh, next slide. The exclusion criteria was basically the use of cannabis in the three weeks before to be allergic or to be in another study. Next slide. So to conclude, we believe that Levy study is an important groundbreaking study, not only because that will tell us how to provide care for this population, but will open the research to, um, to a new field, which is the area of end of life research. And uh, we believe that as we develop the technology and the methodology to do these studies, others will follow. The, the development of the study design has been challenging and continues to be in challenge. And to the study, this specific medication also is very challenging because in the US we have uh, 50 states, each one of them have different approach, different concern, different uh, regulations for the use of cannabis. Uh, also, in some, some states uh, use cannabis uh, for medical, some for not. So basically, we have to get, uh, we have 15 sites and we have 15 different types of approaches that we have to deal with to get uh, the medication to be available in the treatment and in the research environment. It is and continues being a difficult journey, no question. And probably that's a reason why nobody else did it before. But those of us that have seen somebody dying with agitation and dementia know that because it's difficult, we shouldn't stop. As I always said, it's for all the Libis of the world. I'm happy to answer any questions and to translate or add or subtract. 
Thank you so much, Brian, it's all yours. Thank you, Professor Minzer, for your talk. Uh, I just have a curiosity maybe. So can you use CBD and THC to treat other symptoms of uh, AD or, or other dementia? In terms for cognitive symptoms? Yeah, in general, cognitive or other uh, side uh, symptoms you can have. Uh, so, so, so let me tell you this. Um, I, I'm a storyteller, so I will tell you a story, okay? Yeah. And um, my wife, uh, I have, let me start by saying that I'm married 36 years. And one of my goals in life is to keep my wife happy. Good. And, and she wants me to be somebody that is able to do things around the house, right? To fix stuff. And I have no ability whatsoever. So I go to one of the um, hardware stores every week for the only reason to go and buy something. And there is a guy there, his name is Bob. And Bob has his apron around his, his waist. And in his apron, he, um, he has you know, a lot of tools and stuff. And when he sees me, he smiles because he knows I'm going to pay money to buy stuff to do something in the house. And we'll come one week later, I will pay him more money to undo what I did and do it right. So one day I really got upset with him. And I came to him and I said, Bob, you know, I'm a physician. And I make a lot of money and much more money than what you make. So I want you to give me the most expensive hammer you have. You have a titanium hammer, I want it. He looked at me and said, Doc, we don't have good or bad hammers. We just happen to have good or bad carpenters. <laughs> THC, CBD, and THC, CBD, and the cannabinoids offer a unique opportunity to provide care for our patients. However, every plant that we have have a different component of one of the different proportion of 100 different cannabinoids. So the potential is enormous, but all of those, all of us involved in, in drug development, we know that every drug is different at a different dose in a different population. So our challenging challenge is those of one of those that gets into a, you know, a solution. It's like if we open a coffer and we see lots of solutions, we just need to figure out what the problems they were going to solve, right? Yeah. I always say that it's like Canada, it's a solution looking for a problem. So it's the same issue here. We have now to methodolo methodologically, start to understand which components of the cannabinoid have which properties at which dose in which condition. And that is a long work, expensive work, but I hope we're starting it. Because I believe that to receive 4,800 of uh, 4,600 or 4,800 or, or 8, 800 or whatever combination of CBD or any other of the other 98 cannabinoids out there. It's not the same. Yeah. So we need to first isolate all the cannabinoids, be able to, in a reliable way, generate different doses. And that, and then with that, do the appropriate experiments to try to understand which one of those components will help in which condition. I found insulting, to be absolutely honest with you, that in order to get a mildly psychoactive compound, a, a compound that have some activity in the brain, like a serotonin uh, uptake inhibitor, I need to go to a doctor, get a prescription, go to the pharmacy, talk with the pharmacist waiting home, and to get drugs that have a different component of THC and CBD, I go to Bob in the dispensary who will tell me mm, for your back, backache, mm, this one, take this one because you know it has a little bit of something with that. And, and the, for that, mm, you may want to take the other one. I think it makes absolutely no sense and tells about all the, it's more of a cultural rather than a medical problem. So okay. the answer is a long answer to you to say yes, but it, who knows, right? Okay. 
any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question um, in terms of applicability because the agitation is also seen in severe ID uh, patients uh, or in dementia patients. Do you think this uh, uh, this strategy could apply also to to those subjects? I mean, not only end of life. There are a number of our uh, colleagues. Uh... Crystal and Cott, uh, Paul Rosenberg, that they are doing studies on agitation in the mented knot, but they are using uh, synthetic uh, components. And the reason they are doing is because it's extremely difficult to find a, somebody that will provide you purified, uh, um, you know, good, good, good manufacturing practices compounds at the reliable bioactivity uh, that um, in the US is possible in Canada. So no, most people have been shy of doing this type of research, but it, I think that it is going to be effective or it's, li it's as likely in this population as in any other population to be effective, but we just need to be sure that we have laws that will allow us to do multi-center trials with um without having to go to 50 different states to get you know 15 different states to get different regulation and we need to have reliable manufacturing and provision of ip we hope that our effort will pass the way thank you that's wonderful um really interesting talk thank you so if there is no other questions or comments, I would proceed with the next speaker. So the next speaker of the, this session is Dr. Kevenko. I hope I'm pronouncing well the name from Altoida, Luzern, uh, Switzerland. And uh, she will talk about uh, unlocking neurology at scale. Please go ahead. Thank you, Manuela. You pronounced it perfectly, actually, which is very rare. So <laughs> well done for that. Great. Yep. Thank you, Lavinia, for bringing up the slides. So hello, everyone. I will be uh, representing Altoida today and talking about digital biomarkers. Specifically, the title is Unlocking Neurology at Scale. So we can jump right in um, to the next slide. So. The first question is, it's a very interesting title. So why do we even need to unlock neurology? It sounds like a, a fancy kind of marketing word, but what do we actually mean by this? And we can go on to the, the next slide. So this presentation will have more of a focus on clinical barriers and what we need now and what solutions exist that could potentially address these barriers. So this is um, in many different indications and in clinical development in both psychiatry and neurology. So there's a lot of hurdles that are in place. There's a very low understanding of a lot of the disease pathology. Um, there's a lack of precise and timely diagnosis, mainly because even though we use biomarkers in research, it's not really the standard of care in the clinic. There's also a lack of precise and accurate clinical endpoints. So most of the time, the standard of care in the clinic is actually clinical assessment, which has um, a lot of vulnerability towards variability and human error. In terms of variability, then there's also intra-rater and inter-rater variability, and this is amongst different types of measurements. Then, of course, other types of variables, such as patient biases, time, as well as the costs for certain procedures and the scalability of these solutions. We can go to the next slide. So one of the points that I brought up was having a precise and a timely diagnosis, which is a huge unmet medical need in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases. So this is a slide and I will not jump into too much detail as to why, but you can see the average time to diagnosis is quite high, ranging from 12 months to 24 months in some of the main neurodegenerative diseases that we know of for multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, ALS, and Alzheimer's disease. And if we can go on to the next slide. So I highlighted a bunch of different neurodegenerative diseases, but for this talk, we'll focus specifically on Alzheimer's disease. So 
I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here. Most of you already know that it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease and it is the most common form of dementia. It consists of about 50 to 70% of cases worldwide. Um, just for some statistics, there's 7.3 million in Europe and 5.4 million in the US and it's expected to double by 2040. So there will be a huge burden in terms of um, Alzheimer's disease. And it's quite shocking because only a third to about half of people with the disease have actually had a formal diagnosis. And currently the standard of care is clinical diagnosis. Um, an example of that is pictured here to the right. And as I said before, it's prone to a lot of variability as well as human error. And then there's also other non alzheimer disease types of dementia, such as vascular dementia, frontotemporal and Lewy body dementia. And they are also characterized by an initial period of mild cognitive impairment and often with multiple cognitive domain impairment, which then also leads to this certain type of dementia within a three year period. And it's important to be able to differentiate between the different types of MCI and into which pathway they will go into to treat um, the patient properly. And if we can go to the next slide. So I don't think I have to go into this into too much detail either. I'm sure many of you are aware that the main pathological hallmark, hallmarks, and there's many other biomarkers of the disease as well, but for the, the sake of this talk, we will focus specifically on the deposition of beta amyloid plaques, as well as neurofibrillary tangles of tau, that then trigger a cascade of different other pathological processes that feed into one another. And so what does this also mean? It's an intrinsic part into getting the full clinical picture of Alzheimer's disease. So as I mentioned before, the standard of care in the clinic, which is very different from research, is cognitive testing, family history, and very, um, very basic blood tests, such as B12 levels. And pathological levels already start to change in terms of proteinopathy decades before any clinical symptoms start to arise. And earlier in this disease stage around mild cognitive impairment or subjective cognitive de decline is when an intervention would actually be the most effective. So the use of a disease modifying therapy such as the monoclonal antibody. However, diagnosing earlier in the stages in the mild cognitive impairment phase is quite difficult and is not part of the clinical guidelines worldwide. So if we can move on to the next slide. So with that, to set the picture in the context, the next section will be about digital biomarkers in general and how they can potentially address the unmet medical need that patients have in Alzheimer's disease specifically. So on this slide here, um, I'm depicting um, what today's patient journey does actually look like. Um, there is a caveat in that it does vary very much depending on region to region, city to city, even within cities, according to different clinics and their capabilities, this also varies very much. But this is kind of the, the rough idea of what a patient goes through to get to treatment and diagnosis in Alzheimer's. So the patient initially comes and presents to their healthcare provider with cognitive symptoms. And then initial assessment is done, which includes a neuropsychological battery at times, a blood draw, so very basic blood tests, looking at family history and so on. And then this is where we already reach the first barrier. There is a little bit of a bottleneck in terms of the referral to the specialist, as well as the patient then moving on to further testing, such as an MRI or CT scan. In very rare cases, do patients actually receive confirmatory biomarker testing? So amyloid testing, for example, via um, lumbar puncture and measuring uh, proteins in the CSF or amyloid PET. This means that the patient could then also receive a delayed diagnosis, also then receiving a delay in treatment and care. And especially with um, amyloid monoclonal antibodies entering the market, it may be even more crucial to know the amyloid status of the patient, as well as their clinical symptomology prior to treatment to be able to prescribe the drug. And this whole entire journey takes approximately two years, which is a very long time. And by then the patient can really worsen. And so on the next slide, what could digital biomarkers actually offer? And this is looking at a hopeful aspirational future impact on the patient journey. So it would hopefully then unblock that initial part in the initial assessment that then streamlines the referral to the specialist 
getting the patients access to MRI CT as well as having effective triaging tools, enabling quicker access to confirmatory testing. And this can be done with digital biomarkers. And then this could lead eventually to the patient receiving their diagnosis much earlier, as well as the appropriate treatment and care in the point where an intervention would be most effective. So in the mild cognitive impairment or subjective cognitive decline stage. And so I've already spoken aspirationally about the patient journey, how it could be improved, what digital biomarkers could potentially offer, but what does the data show? So I just wanted to highlight um, a publication in 2020 by Max Bugler at AL, where um, we found that digital biomarkers can actually predict conversion from mild cognitive impairment to AD dementia. So this was tested in 450 subjects. Um, both MCI and healthy controls. And the model was able to distinguish between MCI with AD pathology, so positive amyloid and tau biomarkers, that would convert to AD dementia within three years. And AD dementia, this ground truth is based on the clinical diagnosis of the healthcare provider. So this entails a whole cognitive workup as well as biomarker testing that they incorporate into their clinical diagnosis. And this had an AUC of 0.92. So it enabled the identification of mild cognitive impairment patients that then have a high risk of conversion to Alzheimer's disease, disease dementia. And this in turn could help inform treatment and clinical care for the healthcare provider. And on the next slide, on the, from the same publication as well, so this is again tested, a model tested in the same participants, um, the digital biomarkers can not only just distinguish between MCI that would convert to AD dementia, but also has the ability to be able to predict rapid converters. So what does this actually mean? The model was then able to distinguish between um, those with mild cognitive impairment and positive amyloid pathology and tau pathology that would then rapidly decline. So this is within the scope of 18 months versus those that were MCI with positive amyloid and tau biomarkers that had slower decline. So it took more than 18 months to decline. And what do we mean by decline? In, in this uh, terminology, what we mean by cognitive decline is actually um, the MMSC score. And for this, the performance was around 0.91. And one of the medical value that this tool can then offer is that it can identify those that are more likely to rapidly de decline, so the fast progressors, and this could then help the healthcare provider inform changes or adjustments to clinical care to be able to address those that would rapidly progress faster towards full AD dementia more better. So that's from, from some of the, the publications that we've done so far on the neuromotor index. Um, and Altoida is also working on what is called the digital neurosignature. And this is an extension of the publications that you've seen in the past two slides. So this is meant to be an AI-driven diagnostic aid, and there will be two clinical claims that we aspire to. So the identification of mild cognitive impairment, as well as the identification of MCI due to Alzheimer's disease. So the first we've already gone through in the past two slides, that was more about conversion from MCI to full-on AD. But this model would be more of a two-step approach. It would be able to distinguish between those who are cognitively normal and those who have mild cognitive impairment. And then furthermore, it would be able to also distinguish between those who are MCI and have amyloid positivity, so MCI due to AD versus those who do not. Um, and so far, like the preliminary data shows that it's a very sensitive device. Um, and according to a publication, it's about 2.6 times as sensitive as capturing longitudinal um, level change than MMSC itself. I can go to the next slide. So um, to go more into the, the indications and the performance, what I mentioned before was, was again the two indications of use. So what this would potentially look like um, and not to reiterate the, the performance since that was on the previous slide, at the bottom right, you can see here, what would this would then look like is that 
you would screen a population, the intended use population, and with about 94% um, performance, you would be able to distinguish between those who were MCI versus those who were cognitively normal. And then in the second tier, you would then be able to distinguish between those from that subset of mild cognitive impairment, those who have a high likelihood of being amyloid positive versus those who are likely amyloid negative. And again, this is very important because there are different types of MCI. It's tricky to diagnose, and it's also difficult to see in which um, type of dementia they would progress to or another neurodegenerative disease. And this is especially important in the light of rising disease-modifying therapies that would then um, target amyloid and also could have potentially risky side effects such as arias. So I'll go into um, more about the test. It's okay, Lavinia, you can skip that slide. Just wanted to, to bring up the, the term that we've come up with, a digital phenotype. So why is Altoida unlocking neurology? It's a bit more than just a typical um, digital cognitive assessment app. So it's um, software that's been validated over 12 years of research. Um, it has the ability to measure different aspects. So not just cognition, but it also measures cognition, motor function, and executive function in around a 10 to 12 minute test. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I'll elaborate a little bit more on what this looks like as well. So just to give you kind of a helicopter view of what the solution does look like, it uses machine learning, so several algorithms to identify certain signatures of what we are searching for. So this digital phenotype, for example, the MCI due to AD, so MCI with amyloid positivity, it then identifies um, composite markers by analyzing these clusters and associating them with these biological markers. So for example, the ground truth looks at amyloid measured by CSF and PET in a subset of people who are mild cognitively impaired. Um, and this then uh, is done by assessing kind of activities that are supposed to replicate uh, challenges in daily life. So it is about a, a difficult um, cognitive test, and it feeds in data from different sensors that are built into the device. And this, these are the things that feed into the model. So if we go to the next slide, I think it will show exactly what the test will look like. So it's meant to sim simulate um, IADLs. Um, so it's supposed to really show high demand situations that one could face in real life and is used to assess um, uh, cognitive decline. And these simulations, again, measure different components of function. So cognitive, motor, and executive function. And there's four different aspects to the test. There is the tracing task where the participants then use their finger to follow the path of shapes and here speed and accuracy are measured. Then there are target tasks. So they tap um, highlighted targets and shapes as they appear and try to keep the device stable. Then there's some augmented reality tasks where participants, they navigate um, their space and they um, place virtual objects and try to find them again in an augmented reality type experience. And then there's also conversational tasks. So speech where the participants then describe what they see as the images appear on screen and then try to become more abstract. So that's kind of an overview of what the test actually looks like. And the output that you would then get is the following. So the model then feeds in, it extracts from 800 features to figure out the ones that can predict best what you are looking for. So um, you then get an output of what is called the digital neurosignature. So this is the digital phenotype, which I was um, referring to in, in the past few slides. And on top of this digital neurosignature, you also get the score of different cognitive domains. This is a normative score, and it compares your performance to um, the performance of a cognitively healthy uh, population for comparison. And I think if we go to the next slide, it explains a little bit more how this is interpreted. So you get these 13 um, neurocognitive domains, as you saw in the previous slide. Again, as I mentioned, this is based on 800 features that feed into the algorithm. 
And the digital neurosignature is then marked from zero to 100. So as I said before, there are these two clinical claims that we aspire to. So the ability to distinguish mild cognitive impairment versus cognitively normal, as well as being able to distinguish mild cognitive impairment with a high likelihood of amyloid positivity versus other types of mild cognitive impairment. And the score is from zero to 100 and 50 is the cutoff. So anything um, above is then considered uh, pathological and below is normal. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, and then just to go over the clinical impact. So I've mentioned before the, the patient pathway, some of the, some of the publications in, and what is the po possible value that digital biomarkers could potentially offer, especially those that measure um, in a multimodal fashion. So it's not just in terms of clinical care, but there are several different aspects that digital biomarkers could help disrupt. So there's clinical trials where um, these types of tools could be implemented during study screening. This would be able to um, also um, expand recruitment and establish a baseline digital neurosignature score that can be easily followed up and is probably also a cost-effective solution and easy to access. It can also provide itself as a companion diagnostic. It means that it would be a companion diagnostic is something that's tethered to a molecule, to a therapy. So it would be able to identify the right patients that have the right pathology as well as the right cognitive phenotype and be able to streamline them to the correct disease modifying therapy. It could also be used as a potential way to measure therapy response. So it could be an exploratory endpoint to be able to assess disease progression and treatment response, because as you saw before, there's also the ability to measure conversion. And then um, lastly, it could also be used potentially as a screening tool. And this is to enable broader and earlier access to diagnosis. And this is not just explicitly Altoida on its own, but digital biomarkers that really look at the 360 picture of the patient and that really measures in a multimodal fashion. So not just cognitive assessment, but motor function, executive function, and many um, other aspects as well. And um, lastly, I just wanted to go back to this patient pathway. What are the clinical implications? Of course, I've given these four different areas where digital biomarkers can really play a part. But in the end, we do what we do also because we want to help the patients. The beginning and the end ends with the patient. So where there is the most value and the biggest clinical implication is to be able to allow an easy, cost-effective, non-invasive solution for a patient to be able to get an idea of what is affecting them, to be able to streamline their journey along the pathway to get a diagnosis faster and to get the right type of care and the right type of treatment faster as well. And so with that, um, I'd like to end that as my final remarks. And in the next slide, I've put in my contact details below, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention um, and open to any questions you may have. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kavenko, for this inspiring talk. Yeah, I I have a curiosity, maybe. Uh, I think that uh, an important point is that you have to train also people to learn uh, and then perform in a correct way all these, let's say, exercises. Otherwise, what you get is just something wrong that can they then impact on the final analysis or on the ongoing, ongoing analysis that you are doing. Yes, definitely. I mean, that's a very good point, uh, Emanuela, and that's also something that we very much emphasize. If anyone wants to use the tool, it is compulsory that there's an initial training phase with the patient where the clinician is with them, and then you do the training together, and then they do the assessment. So definitely true. It's especially with um, a test that is actually quite cognitively demanding. So if you do ever try it, it, it's something that you need to concentrate on quite a lot. And if you do not understand the instructions properly, it, it can go a bit haywire. So very good point. Training is absolutely 
absolutely a must in this case. Yeah, and just another small thing. I see this kind of approach may be more effective in the young generation, so of the future potential patients, because then we, let's say we already know how to use technological devices, so maybe it's easier to unconsciously learn, let's say, so you absorb all the information, the instructions, and then once you get older, maybe it's easier to perform uh, correctly all the all the parameters and uh, uh, exercises you propose. That's very true. I mean, that's also one of the potentials that the tool could have. I mean, at the moment right now, the focus is very much on an older population, like 55 years and above, just because that's when mild cognitive impairment is more likely to strike or subjective cognitive decline. But at some point, and hopefully in the future, it could be a wider population screening type tool. And I think, it, yeah, you're right. It would be easier to adopt. Um, but we, we do train older patients and there haven't been very big issues in being able to do it, especially once you train them once or twice. And there's no learning effect as well. So you can train them a couple of times and they won't significantly improve, improve just because they've done it a couple of times. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Lavinia? Uh, yeah. I have a question, yeah. It was, it was um, a little bit unclear to me. Uh, your device, uh, um, so it's a point of care, but it is uh, of use for the clinician or for the patients? I mean, in the future, probably just as a screening tool for, for everyone, but at this particular time for uh, allowing a stratification, um, uh, would it be given to, to, the, to the clinician at the first visit when the subject has cognitive complaint? When, when should this digital biomarker tool be implemented? Because we know when cognitive symptoms arise, probably it's too, too late, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, um, thanks for the question, Lavinia. So to, to clarify at the moment, so some of it that I've presented, like the DNS score is something that has not yet reached regulatory approval. So it's still something that's very much in, in the process of getting regulatory approval. The converter um, claim that was in the publication, so that one is 510k exempt. So that's um, able, you're able to use that as well in um, CEMAR countries. But this, just to clarify, is, is different to a diagnostic. It is a cognitive assessment aid, and this has to be used and ordered by your physician. So at the moment, everything is at the physician's level. Um, we would recommend that it, it's, it's to be done at first visit, mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of where it lies right now. And our hope for the future is that it doesn't only just detect a cognitive phenotype, but it is also then able to um, kind of detect, you know, a high likelihood of a pathology, and then you can kind of streamline your way into biomarker testing. I also had a question regarding the this uh, discrimination capacity of uh, MCI amyloid versus uh, non-amyloid. I mean, I, maybe you cannot disclose this, but I would be just interested in uh, knowing which feature, uh, if it's a visual uh, impairment or rather than, you know, if it's a sensory impairment rather than a cognitive impairment. Uh, to be honest with you, for, for that specific claim, I haven't seen the, the data yet to which features map best onto the amyloid DNS score. I know for the converter one, I think it was like perceptual processing, planning, and then I think two others. It might, but I would anticipate it to be similar, but maybe one or two features being different, but I haven't seen the, the data yet. It's still early days. And um, conversion, I mean, how, how long uh, in the uh, trajectory was, was this happening? Like two years later or three years later? Yeah, within, within three years was within the benchmark that we put. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically, um, anyone uh, of after 65 should, should use it uh, just as a, by the general practitioner. 
that's the hope one day i mean, yeah, I mean uh, not only i mean if it has to be in the hand of the uh of the physician does not need to be a neurologist per se mm -hmm. right yeah especially if it's just if it's just limited to the the cognitive diagnosis or the cognitive aid mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely probably a useful tool yeah. it's just i think at the um for the dns where it would also include the amyloid signature that would have to be more in the specialist care yeah okay that's uh, interesting i think uh we had uh two years ago i think we had a twitter already but definitely uh one of our members it's uh the former employee of altoida and i think you well you you progressed a lot and you had a lot of uh good publications and very promising uh data uh, definitely more biomarkers in aggregate to give you more information Okay, thank you, thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. And Francis, I know you're not going to stay uh, until the panel discussion, but uh, we'll certainly talk about your uh, of your talk and uh, the potential of a digital biomarker in uh, um, in building strata for treatment. That sounds perfect. And also, I put my email address in the yeah. final slide, so people are yeah. welcome to send me their questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. So we go on, and uh, I'm happy to present the third speaker, Professor Cheng from the Lerner Institute, Research Institute of Cleveland, Ohio. He will talk about harnessing genetics and network medicine for discovery of pathobiology and drug repurposing in Alzheimer's disease. Please go. Yeah, thank you so much for your introduction. Can you see my slide and help me as well? Yes, oh. all good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would say, you know, good afternoon, everyone. Now we are time is 1 p.m. So, and I'm Fei Xiong Ching. I'm an assistant professor from Cleveland Clinical. So today I'm very happy to share some work we just done recently, how we use the endophenotype and more like a network medicine approach to identify the potential past biology and, uh, you know, you know, you know, treatment like a drug repositioning in Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, required by my institute, the, the drug we discussed here cannot be used, you know, to guideline for patient treatment. So, you know, before my presentation, I really, you know, wanted to introduce my young lab to all of you. I call my lab is more like Alzheimer's network medicine lab. So our goal is trying to utilize the artificial intelligence network medicine and a system pharmaco pharmacogenomic approach to identify you know, drug target or therapeutic approach from the genetic and the genomic findings. At the same time, we, our lab also do some bench work, including you know, animal model and, and you know, you know, iPSL, like a stem cell derived you know, neural model as well. So this slide is really just to show the overall technology we try to implement in my you know, you know, laboratory you know, for you know, drug target identification and a therapeutic discovery from human genome sequencing findings use the artificial challenging and a multi-omics approach. So the idea is, you know, right now we can generate a different type of omics data, including like a genetic, genomic, transcriptome, proteomics data from the cell tissue or organs we can collect from the patient samples or even different type, you know, you know, models like animal models. And then we're trying to you know, build, you know, predictive model, like uh, use the artificial intelligence or machine learning approach, you know, from this multi-omics data we generate. And then we use this AI, you know, or ML model to, for target, you know, target, drug target identification and a drug prediction as well. And then we try to take a different type, you know, you know, function model, including like a cellular model, including like a stem cell derived neural model from 80 patients to, for the validate our AI and machine learning prediction, we also take a different type of you know, AD transgenic mouse model for in vivo study as well. Another you know, data we use here, we call year trial data, electronic health record data to further validate the drug outcome in real world patient. You know, if we get access from computational level, functional level, and a patient data level, we may probably can move this kind of drug candidate for further drug you know, clinical trial testing further. 
So this just, you know, brief summarize my today's presentation. First, I will give you a very brief introduction why we do the Alzheimer's network medicine. And then I will introduce two specific projects, you know, you know in particular focus on endophenotype for target identification and drug repositioning in Alzheimer's. What kind of like a tau and amyloid synergistic endophenotype. The third endophenotype work, we work on the microglial activation, you know, phenotype. The final, I just really, you know, closing with our future, you know, research direction and ongoing, you know, you know, research project. I think most of us know that Alzheimer's today we discussed in the in this morning, right? It's really challenging the disease. And but however, more challenging is the first therapeutic discovery in the past few decades. You know, this disease, Alzheimer's, was you know discovered by more than 100 years ago. But right now we don't have or we really, you know, lack, you know, you know, effective treatment like a disease modified, you know, treatment for this challenging disease. For example, you know, the drug discovery for AD field is really challenging, like 99% you know, failure rate in this field. And the good news in the couple of years, you know, the anti-amyloid antibody get some, you know, you know, preliminary success for good example last year is aducanumab, but many, many physicians in, in the US also include European also argue this is the controls approval. And the good news just come out in San Francisco meeting, like a you know, a couple of weeks ago, also talk about, uh, the, you know, land you can mass also shows some positive results. However, other, you know, amyloid antibody from like a roach, you know, they also show some very negative results. They show that, you know, the, you know, you know anti-amyloid burden, right, reduced amyloid burden is not highly correlated with the clinical benefit they see in the clinical, you know, patients. This really put some, you know, challenging, you know, or limitation for anti-amyloid hypothesis for this field. So here, you know, A and B just summarize, you know, some ongoing or some finished, you know, you know, field, you know, clean draw, you know, you know, drug for AD field and also across different type, you know, you know, drug category as well. So one challenge in our lab, we really argue is, you know, the 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 challenge for this field or the drug field is really about the reduction is, you know, you know, hypothesis people used for you know, biology and medicine study, in particular for molecular medicine study in the past, you know, in a century. You know, people argue like aging or AD is really just a single gene or single mutation issue, right? If we can identify this mutation or gene or protein, we can just fix this protein and gene, we can get a care of this disease. However, the reality is not, right? Many, many failures we see and many, many failures will also repeat in multiple clinical trials as well. So our lab, we argue is we really need a more like a system-based approach to address this kind of challenge of disease, we, we call network medicine approach. The traditional, you know, you know, single omics approach, people argue why not work real well, because you know, you know, Alzheimer's is not really caused by genetic or many, many other you know, risk factors, like uh, environment factor, diet, you know, or any others may also cause the disease as well. This means this diet or environment factor may also can be represent by you know, transcription data or epigenetic data. So combine the genetic data with the other type of multi-omics data really can help us to better understand the complexity of this disease. So, you know, my lab, we are working on the network medicine module, model. Our idea is we want to build a global knowledge for Alzheimer's disease by leveraging, you know, multi-omics data we just brief, you know, you know, list here. So our idea is this kind of global knowledge really provide us, you know, you know, better information to help us to predict the right target for therapeutic discovery, or even provide us some, you know, model for patient certification for the clinical trial, you know, design or drug testing further as well. So how we do that? So one model I want to really want to share with you, our lab work on this idea is, you know, include my postdoc training, include about, you know, one decades. We also call you know, the human interaction approach. So in this video, each job just shows a human protein and a connection, just shows a protein protein connection, you know, you know, interaction you cannot see here. So our idea is here is we try to leverage multi-omics data, including genomic transcription and proteomics data into this complex human protein protein interaction. And then we're trying to apply some algorithm we, you know, develop to identify the pink, you know, you know, uh, module we highlight here, we call the disease module. And then we use this disease module to predict the pathway and the biological for this disease. And then we can authorize potential target for therapeutic discovery. But some limitation I want to highlight here is the human intact network we use right now 
it's not really brain or brain cell type specific network. The network we use here is really just a generic network generate or identify from different cell type and a tissue. But the good news is, is there's protein protein interaction network we use here is the physical protein protein interaction. It means if this two protein can be expressed in the neuron or any you know, brain cell type, this protein protein interaction we should be able to identify. So let me come, come to the concept about the endophenotype. I, I know, you know most of you know the endophenotype. So endophenotype is really a new definition for disease we call biological definition for the disease. Why we, we argue that? Because we argue traditional clinical definition for challenging disease like Alzheimer's disease is not you know, you know, you know, helpful, you know, we demonstrated in the past few years. And, and AD diagnosis is really much, much delayed in the clinical, you know, compared to the biological definition. So our argument, however, when you tested the drug in clean trial, the drug only tested in the earlier stage patient, not a later stage. But the biological network or the omics data we generate only in the later stage of AD patient or even dementia patient. So we really need to identify the biological pathway or the target they can represent in the earlier disease or even can represent the progression for the disease. So here we just highlight a few, you know, the main or primary, you know, in a, you know, endophenotype people just focus on like, you know, amyloid, tau, neuroinflammation, you know, metabolic and vascular. But if you look at this field more, you know, carefully, you'll see, you know, much, you know, more endophenotype of people have been proposed in this field. So in the first story I want to share with you is about the amyloid and the tau synergistic endophenotype. Why we're interested in that? You know, this idea came from some, you know, very, you know, you know, you know, nice, you know, review we just highlight here. For example, you can see here when we look at the, the disease progression or the disease process for Alzheimer's disease, you can see, you know, the hallmark like amyloid and tau, we can see in the very earlier stage of AD, even the preclinical AD as well means amyloid can be happened in a few years earlier or even five, 10 years earlier, people diagnose it for AD. So, and, and similar things we also see in the tau as well. However, you know, like I discussed in the, you know, previous slide is anti-amyloid hypothesis also have challenging and also limitation as well. And so far, most of the tau or anti-tau antibody also feel in the clean trial as well. And then we look at the, this field more, you know, carefully and more deep, we found a very interesting idea is people propose is, you know, people, you know, propose that and also identify that in the clinical data or the patient data is, you know, AD patient or AD progression is not just driven by the amyloid or tau, you know, alone. They're really driven by the synergistic inter interaction or co-current, you know, between tau and amyloid in the AD patients, you know, when they look at the product scan data. And this kind of, you know, you know, hypothesis people also demonstrate in the different AD transgenic mouse model or even, you know, say elegant model means the tau and amyloid synergistic drive the AD progression. And this, you know, hypothesis really, you know, demonstrated by a large scale product scan data just published in neuron this year, April, you know, by, you know, international group in multiple cohort study they really show that, you know, the you know, beta and the tau interaction really pro promote the onset of AD. Also, you know, you know, progression of AD as well. You know, based on this kind of, you know, you know hypothesis, we propose a sim simple idea is, could we, you know, do targeting both tau and amyloid hypothesis? This kind of, you know, medicine or, you know, treatment approach may provide, you know, more or high, you know, clinical benefit compared if we just target the tau and the amyloid, you know, you know, hypothesis or pathway alone. How we do that, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, my lab to work on the network medicine idea. So we try to use our tools. We can identify, you know, amyloid pathway we highlight by blue, and also can identify the tau pathway on the module by orange. And then we can identify the synergistic module shared by tau and amyloid. So our idea is if, if we can identify the medicine or medication or drug, this drug can specific synergistically target both tau and amyloid pathway, this kind of medicine or the drug may show more you know, clinical benefit for patients. So I would thank you, you know, you know, National Institute of Aging, we call NIA, you know, from National Institute of Health, 
you know, you know, support our project. So we just proposed this idea to, you know, NIA in about three years ago, and we get funded. So, you know, they also provide us to get access to large scale, you know, market omics data and uh, genetic data across the diversity, you know, you know, populations. So we can build, you know, you know, from the genetic data or our, our multi omics data, we can build amyloid specific, you know, network from the amyloid specific genome. This is what I mean. So we can identify the genetic or the transcription data or proteomics data from the individuals. These individuals have amyloid, you know, neuropathology, or individuals have a tau, you know, you know, neuropathology. And then we apply our network approach. We can identify the shared or synergistic phenotype shared by tau and a beta. And then we use this, you know, synergistic network shared by tau and a beta, you know, you know, as a target you know, you know, or network module for the drug prediction. So, you know, for the drug prediction, we use the idea I think most of know is we call the drug repositioning idea, it means we can try to identify the drug approved by FDA for other different diseases, may probably can use it for new disease like Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, my laboratory not just for Alzheimer's disease, we also apply this kind of drug repositioning idea for other, you know, different diseases like COVID-19, you know, pandemic as well. So drug reposition can really significantly reduce the timeline and the cost during you know, the drug discovery or the drug development pipeline compared to the you know, you know, de novo drug discovery. So the approach we use this approach to build up, you know, you know, based on our existing or previous work, we call network-based drug repositioning approach. We also call the network proximity. Like I showed you before, from the human interaction work, we can identify the disease module, like a, the tau and amyloid shared, you know, you know, network module, and then for different drug, we know the drug target in the human protein protein interaction network. So we can systematic way to predict which drug target or protein is more close to the disease module, like the tau and amyloid synergistic module, and then we can prioritize the drug list for further functional testing or the drug testing as well. So. This we just show our predicted result, results, show some top, you know, you know, 13 predicted results. Totally we're screening about, you know, you know, 1600 FDA approved drug. And we highlight a few top drug, you know, list here. And, uh, you know, before we choose a drug for further, you know, you know, experimental validation or patient validation, we also validate our drug use some, you know, other type of omics data, like, a you know, different, you know, patient, you know, proteomics data or, you know, mouse model, you know, omics data to further validate our prediction as, as well. So from this top 30 predict drug, we come out an interesting drug. It's a top predict drug we call Sedinifor. So Sedinifor is a PDE5 inhibitor in FDA approved for erotide dysfunction, also used as an over, uh, off level use for pulmonary hypertension as well. So you know, why we choose the Sedinfo? Because Sedinfo is a really, really good example for drug repositioning by Pfizer like two decades ago. You know, initially Sedinfo was, you know, you know, developed for heart disease treatment, but finally people found the side effect and this drug failed. But Pfizer really reproposed this side effect drug like Sedinfo to treat the erotic dysfunction and this gives a billion dollars, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, for, for this, you know, kind of, you know, drug reposition idea. So we choose the Sedinifo for further validation, use the, the real-world patient data I will introduce in the next slide. What I mean the real-world patient data? Means you know, in the US, also include the European or other country as well. So we can collect the largest scale electronic health recorded data during the clinical practice. And each individual we have drug treatment information. So from this real-world data, we can design different you know, drug cohort study. For example, we can design the Sedinifo users means this individuals take Sedinifo or individual doesn't take Sedinifo. We also use the you know, other kind of you know, drug comparable design. So in all this kind of analysis, we all justify all possible co-funding factors like age, sex, race, disease co comorbidities based on our existing knowledge. So what we find interesting is we find, you know, Sedinifo also associated with the reduced likelihood of AD when we look at this real world patient data. So we also compare to other drug class here. For example, we compare to like Losata and metformin. These two drug, these two drug I have been used, you know, or testing in the phase two AD clinical trial as well. We found individuals take Sedinifo 
compared to the individual take metformin or losartan, selenium for also you know significant you know associated with the reduced incidence of AD as well. This may show you know selenium for may have potential you know or possible prevention effect for AD as well. So we also look at a more like a subgroup analysis to look at the individuals. These individuals have coronary artery disease or individuals have hypertension. And we see you know, similar you know, in a pattern here, but you can see the hazard ratio we highlight here you know, left is much worse than individuals you know, without these you know, comorbidities. We also see the similar pattern for you know, type 2 diabetes as well. So this subgroup analysis also further confirms that you know, sildenafil may be associated with a reduced incidence of AD in the real world patient data. So next step, we really wanted to see why sildenafil is approved for advertised dysfunction and primary hypertension once sildenafil associated with a reduced likelihood, you know, of AD. So we, you know, you know, I want to thank you, you know, my postdoc, you know, she helped us to build the AD patient derived neural model about one month. And, and then we can take this, you know, AD patient derived neural model for further mechanism, you know, you know, testing. For example, we see that, you know, sildenafil may can, you know, you know, can or could increase the neurotype growth, means have like a neural protection effect or increase the neurogenesis in AD patient, IPSA derived neurons. And then we also look at, you know, the tau hypophosphorylation is a key, you know, hallmark in, in AD as well. We also see that sildenafil also reduces the tau hypophosphorylation in AD patient derived neuron. The YX just show P tau 181. We also look at the others like uh, the P tau 217 and the P tau 205. We see the similar pattern as well. This just really show sildenafil may have some mechanistic effect in the AD patient IPSA derived neurons. So just give you know brief you know brief summarize here. But I really wanted to you know, summarize here. I think our study really you know, provides a proof concept for the combination of therapeutics development in the future for Alzheimer's disease. This is a really challenging disease. We cannot just control or treat this disease by targeting a single pathway. We need the combination approach. Our you know, tau and a beta synergistic pathway really provide a you know, proof concept for combination design in the future. And based on these findings, you know, we also, you know, trying to propose and conduct the, you know, the, you know, pilot trial to further test the sildenafil in our AD patient using the different, you know, biomarker as a primer or secondary in a point. We just work on this kind of, you know, you know, clinical trial right now. And the second example I want to show you beyond the tau and inner phenotype, people also talk about the inflammation or microglia activation. I really want to share with you as well about the second endophenotype, we work on the inflammation endophenotype or microglial oral activation. So this idea really come from our, you know, you know, ongoing you know, single cell and a single nuclear RNA sequence in you know, a study. So our idea is could we identify like a molecule drivers or networks, you know, at the single cell level, we can really can reduce the toxicity, you know, for by specifically targeting the disease or AD relevant cell type. So this is our ongoing project. We use that like a like a 10 X genomic technology, try to generate a larger scale single cell, you know, on a sequence data and attack on sequence data by leveraging the frozen brain tissue we collected from the multiple ADRC, we call AD Research Center across the US. This is our ongoing effort. So one idea we tested here is to focus on the disease associated microglia. I think most of you know this concept as well. So I would thank my postdoc, you know, Jilin, you know, she helped us, you know, to, you know, develop a network based methodology. We can use this methodology to identify molecule drivers or molecule network for, you know, you know, cell type specific level from the single cell or single nuclear ion sequence data. After we identify these molecule drivers or molecule network for AD relevant cell type, like a disease associated microglia, and then we can use this network or or molecule drivers to predict the drug candidate, and then we can further to validate this drug candidate as well. So here, just to show you an example, we use the AD transgenic, like a 5X FAD mouse model, single nuclear, you know, on a sequence data, we can identify the disease associated microglia. You can see we highlight in the middle, like the pink show the disease associated microglia based on well-established, you know, the marker gene we can collect from the literature data. 
So you can see in the AD, you can see only a small portion of cell type like myoglia is the disease relevant. Not all cell type are disease relevant. Majority cell type is homostasis microglia. So if we can really target, you know, all, you know, disease relevant cell type, a small portion, this may can reduce the toxicity, but also in, improve the act, you know, efficacy as well. So here, just to show example, the multiple network for disease associated microglia, we identify use the GPS net approach. We and you know we we develop. So you can see here some like a key AD risk gene or genetic supported gene like BIN1 or many others are highly enriched in the dam you know multiple network we identify. And then when we perform the pathway enrichment analysis, you can see here multiple key immune or adaptive immune pathway are highly enriched by the you know, molecular network we identify for them. So we also perform additional, you know, you know, you know, you know, gene, you know, you know, function genomic enrichment analysis. We also can identify the you know microglia or them specific regulatory gene, you know, after we combine the genetic data like genome association data with the function genomic data as well. This is our unpublished data. So you know, beyond to look at the single, you know, you know, you know, cell type like disease associated microglia, we also look at the other cell type as well because the cell is not isolated in our tissue or organ. For example, we also look at how disease associated microglia interact with the disease associated astrocytes and the neuron as well. You can see we just had a few interesting results here. We found some key, you know, receptor or ligand may involved in this kind of, you know, just cell cell communication as well. For example, we highlight just like C5 is a key complement, you know, inflammatory gene people reported in the AD or, you know, you know, inflammation in the AD, you know, model as well, or patient sample. This just give you example, you know, we are not just working on single cell type, we also need to work on, you know, cell cell communication as well. So next step is we really wanted to predict drug. This drug can specific target this disease relevant cell type or this drug can block this kind of you know cell cell interaction as well. So use this kind of you know you know approach, we identify a few drug candidates. For example, we just highlight two interesting you know anti-inflammatory drug like a flicker or more medicine. This is two FDA approved you know inflammatory drug for asthma treatment. But when we look at the in the real world patient data, we see in individuals who take the flicker also significantly reduce you know risk for AD. And momadazone is a more stronger anti-inflammatory drug compared to the flagellazone. You can see here, interestingly, individuals take the momadazone how more stronger, you know, reduce like incidence of AD compared to the flagellazone. Really, just to show proof concept, you know, you know, this kind of anti-inflammatory, you know, you know, medicine may be a potential, you know, prevention or even treatment, you know, you know, effect for AD in the future. So here, just to show, you know, you know, brief summarize. Here we just show, you know, you know, you know, proof concept for disease or switching the microglia we can identify from the single cell omics approach use our you know network based algorithm, and we also show the proof concept. You know, this kind of disease relevant cell type like them may be a awful potential drug target for AD treatment as well. So you know, we work on the, the dry lab. We also make all the data we you know generate and we collect it available for our audience. So if you're interested, in, you can just play our website here. So you can search any drug or any gene you're interested in. You also can download the larger scale single cell data we assembled for your own project as well. So here we just brief summarize here. So our goal is not really, you know, for AD treatment, not just work on the single, you know, you know, or monotherapy. We really work on the drug combination idea to combine beyond tau amyloid and information. We also work on the other endocrine type as well. So we really want to take the genome, you know, driving the drug, you know, discovery concept for AD. Hopefully, we can learn a lot from the cancer field and make this kind of idea successful for AD field as well. So I just really summarize, you know, the people work on this project, in particular for someone I highlight here. Also, thank you my collaboration. Also, thank you for the support from the NIA National Institute on Aging as well. So I just stop here. Thank you for your. Uh, sorry, sharing your data, Professor Chang. You are a lot. <laughs> so I got a bit lost uh, in remembering all of them, but I have simple question. So sure. why do we continue to to try to develop antibodies against uh, amyloid if we know that 
that they fail or they are not enough? Oh, I, I like I mentioned, I, I would I would not see the amyloid hypothesis is wrong, but amyloid hypothesis had been tested in the right population. For example, you know, endocannel map, and map, people also show that successful as well, right? So Another idea we propose here is if we just target the uh, anti-amyloid pathway, it's not enough because you know AD is not just caused by anti, you know, amyloid pathway, also by many, many like tau and inflammation. So the drug combination idea, even cocktail idea, by combine, you know, anti-amyloid drug like endocannabinoid, lantocannabinoid with other medication we available in the clean trial may provide you know you know you know possible you know treatment. Mm -hmm. For AD in the future, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Lavinia, yeah, I was just intrigued by the analysis you you did on uh, sildenafil because uh, you have a lot of uh, male patients in there that I'm sure that are taking so and yeah. of course female are more affected uh, by the disease than the yeah. male. But I'm sure you did. I just uh, I, this was just a question <laughs> from my <laughs> side. Yeah, exactly. This is really, really important and a, and a good question. We also discussed about it during the time in our paper, we also show the sex difference as well. So, you know, we unfortunately we don't have a big, you know, you know, female, you know, you know, population we can test this idea. Definitely we should to test the sex specific, you know, response or efficacy in the future as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. This is very, you know, key question we have to figure out in the future. So um, I saw I saw there were also other candidates uh, uh, and um, in the vascular uh, the vascular uh, field and uh, whether do you you know besides sildenafil where you have you know a more a biased population uh, is there any other candidate that you can look retrospectively? Yeah, yeah, I, I, exactly, and uh, you know because time you know. You know, our, our recent publication just come out, of, I think, two weeks ago in the early yeah. of this month, public in cell report. We also identify other medication like a, like a anti cholesterol drug or anti lipid drug or even anti you know hypertension drug also have a you know potential candidate we may can further test as well. We show this data in the real world patient as well. So yeah, ex exactly, they have multiple you know possible drug candidate we can you know focus on in the future. May I add something, Dr. Chen? Mark Nelson here, next speaker. Uh, you you had minocycline in your list, so uh, I'm going to touch on that. So we'll talk about the tetracyclines in AD. Oh yeah, interesting idea. I, I'm not a female. This you know this drug, but yeah, we can we definitely can explore more as well. Yeah. Well, you had it on your slide, and it's got a rich history. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I provide an email, right? So my email is very simple. You, if you have any any suggestion, you know, I feel free to send my email. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe we can discuss a little bit more yeah. in the panel. Uh, and now we give the word uh, to Manu again. And yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. So it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker of this session, Dr. Nelson from the CP Lab, Novato, California, USA. Hey, we Great. talk about, uh, yeah. The tetracycline, so the stage is yours. Great. Can you see this, everybody? Yes. You see you a chemical go. structure? Okay. Yeah. Oh, we see. Not, not that. Okay. Hang on a second. All right. Tetras My job today is to tell you a story about a family of molecules that's been around for 75 years this year, by the way. And it's, it's an exquisite dynamic family. And I've been working in it for almost half of that time, by the way. And I want to tell you a story, but I got to tell you about the antibiotic properties first, because guess what? A quarter of our cells contain a bacteria called mitochondria. And I'm going to convince you that these compounds are exquisite modulators of neurodegeneration. So first off, though, let me tell you about the tetracyclines. And here's the chemical structure. It's got structural locants. There's a first generation of tetracyclines that are from soil bacteria, and I can talk about that too. But mankind and pharma companies spent a lot of money making uh, second and third generation tetracyclines, including a company that we started out of Boston called Paratech Pharmaceuticals. Anyway, 
these second generation and now third generation compounds hit the ribosome. And that's what they thought was working in bacteria. Okay, you knock out protein synthesis in bacteria. And everybody wants to treat bacteria pathogens. And we know all about them, the escape pathogens. Well, back in 1987, I joined Dr. Stuart Levy at Tufts Medical School. And I started to make compounds that inhibited efflux pumps in bacteria. And the goal was, was to make a compound that would knock out tetracycline resistant pumps and allow tetracyclines to go in. So I started synthesizing all these compounds and with all these thiols. And, and basically I came up with this compound, 13 CPTC. And it, when I threw it into a cell line, resistant cells pumped the drugs out. Here's a radio labeled. And by the way, I did this experiment two in the morning in Boston because I was so excited. If I could show that I could have this drug knock out these efflux pumps, maybe I'd be on to something. Well, actually, it caught a lot of attention because next year we formed Paratech Pharmaceuticals with uh, Wally Gilbert from Biogen in Harvard. He was the founder of Biogen, by the way, and Stuart. And so we, we created this spin out out of Tufts University School of Medicine that's currently, uh, 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 I'll tell you about that too. So basically, I started modifying tetracyclines. And I, this is chemistry. I want to go into it, but nobody had really paid attention to this kind of chemistry. And I started doing all these transition metal couplings and modifying the structure. In the meantime, we're building the labs and everything in downtown Chinatown, Boston. And uh, it, it was quite of a dynamic time because nobody was working on tests. So I did all this chemistry. My, me and my chemist synthesized 3,000 derivatives. Uh, here's a family of compounds that I call the seven phenyl sand cyclines. And this taught me something. It taught me something that not all antibiotics are created equal, okay? And this slide right here shows you that a dirty little secret in the antibiotic world, okay? And that is, is that as you change the chemical structure of a antibiotic, they do different things to membranes in bacteria. And they also do different things to membranes in mammalian cells as well. So this molecule here with this dimethylamine was totally safe. We call it a typical tech. Whereas if I changed uh, uh, the molecule and put fluorines on it, it became atypical and it acted as an ionophore, by the way. But anyway, I don't want to talk about that, but here's my, 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 my lovely colleague, Dr. Mohammed Ishmael. And you know, science is about people, by the way, and, and how people evolve over time. So Mohammed joined me, Dr. Ishmael joined me. He was the last guy out of Somalia before things got tough there. And he joined my lab and I said, hey, let's make these amino methyl cyclines. Because back in Wyeth days in the 1950s, um, um, they tried to do this and they didn't succeed. So him and I worked all this. We worked for two years on this project and we synthesized this amino methyl minocycline derivative. Well, that compound turned out to be a really potent antibiotic. And so we tested all these compounds and that's compound number six. And that's the compound that went into a thigh wound model. And that's the compound that had good pharmacokinetics and was orally available. And we put it into humans, phase two. And here's the proof of the pudding. You know, you could do all the chemistry you want, but if it doesn't work, look at the wheel and the inflammation on this patient. After three days cured, after a month totally cured. So that compound was approved in 2018 called Nuzira, and uh, it's a, a beautiful compound. It's orally active, and uh, me and my chemist, and by the way, my I'm so proud of him. It was like the United Nations of Science, by the way. People from all over the world worked with us in Boston, and uh, but him and I got that award, and we were so happy. Now, it's an antibiotic company, by the way, and nobody made a lot of money out of it, okay, because antibiotic companies are in trouble. But I will tell you that uh, Nuzira sold $100 million last year, and uh, we were just so happy about that. And it's because it's an oral drug, and it actually works, okay? So that sets the stage. But by the way, tetracyclines, we were targeting them, okay? And what I haven't told you is that simultaneously, I started looking at the anti-inflammatory activity. And uh, by the way, we got a BARDA contract as a work against anthrax, so that's... It just shows you you can target different bacterial families. But let me tell you about the mammalian side. 
and where this is going because tetracyclines affect mammalian disease states in health. And this was observed as soon as they were discovered in the 1940s. But it took Larry Golub and, uh, to understand that they worked against collagenases. And then his partner, uh, Bob Greenwald, started studying it in rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, uh, and back then, all they had was minocycline and doxycycline. There were no third generation derivatives. Well, anyway, doxycycline, oops, back up. Doxycycline is the first matrix metalloprotease inhibitor that's ever been approved, okay? So a lot of, a lot of time went by. I call it the area, uh, era of inflammation study. When I met these guys, they invited me up to a conference and I thought, well, how many people could be here? 10, 20, 30? There were 350 people that were studying the, the non-antibiotic effects of the tetracyclines. Well, in 2015, I read Johan Auerks' paper, and he described how doxycycline modifies mitochondria. And, you know, I had always wanted to work against mitochondria because there are alpha uh, proteobacter ancestors, and they are affected exquisitely by tetracyclines. And nobody really understood that till Johan uh, published his paper in 2015. And with that, you know, I've gone, uh, I've gone away from antibiotics for now, but, you know, because of Nikki Schultak, you know, uh, I want to talk about a little bit about intracellular activity. But in this case, we are looking at a new uh, paradigm, a new mode of action of the tetracyclines. And I got a couple startups that are based on that. I want to talk about our animal data and where we're going. So, but by the way, back in 1990, we had a whole Gordon conference called the Non-Antibiotic Properties of Tetracyclines. And there's Stuart Levy, and there's, uh, uh, there's Bob Greenwald, and there's Larry, and this fellow right here that I, 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 I met, his name's Herman Bujard, and he invented the TED on, TED off system, and I worked with him for a while, and it gave me a long insight into how molecules work at the molecular level. This guy right here, uh, anthropologist, totally different story. If I got time, I'll, I'll breeze through that too. But uh, we are not, or no, let me put, this, put it to you this way. Alexander Fleming was not the first guy to really use a tetracycline or an antibiotic or really discover antibiotics. But, you know, that's a debatable point. And I, I got the proof for that. Any case, here's all the activities that you'll find for minocycline in a, in, in, uh, neuroprotection. And this is just a partial list. I didn't want to bore you with all this, but minocycline has all these different activities that people have been studying since its inception. Um, if you look at some of the, uh, the more interesting to me is, you know, minocycline affects schizophrenia. And there are people at Icon School of Medicine who studied this. And it could be because, you know, schizophrenia has a point, a point of, of neuroinflammation. And then they studied, you know, minocycline and ALS. Well, you know, they said it didn't work, but then I look at how much they used, 400 milligrams a day, and they didn't account for PGP transporters, by the way. And that's an important thing because antibiotics can be taken in across the blood brain barrier by PGP transporters. And when we were in Boston, we had our own vivarium and we did uh, 100 uh, PKPD studies a month. And we started to see differences in blood-brain barrier penetration of antibiotics. To this day, I still study that, okay? But anyway, if you look at the clinical trials that are going on with minocycline today, uh, you'll see that, you know, there's over 250 and that most of them are not as antibiotics. They're for everything from brain infl inflammation to neuroprotection. Uh, uh, I study stroke and ischemia, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but all these different inflammatory diseases, spinal cord trauma, you know, we, uh, Dr. Chen just mentioned GBM. I've studied that with the tetracyclines, TBI, but look at all these other different, you know, uh, 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 neurological problems that the that minocycline has been uh, implicated to help in. And I just read one about schizophrenia. And uh, uh, it just came out in the Lancet. So, you know, these things are happening. You look at doxycycline, it's the same story. Now, doxycycline has a different chemical structure and it acts differently uh, as far as crossing the blood-brain barrier, but 
it doesn't have all the, the problems that minocycline does in metabolism. And, uh, but in any case, doxycycline is a great drug. It's, it's been implicated in cardio protection. It's still being studied in, 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 in the clinic and it just does all these wonderful things. So I got involved with neuroprotection through Mark Halterman, who's now the chair of neurology at SUNY Stony Brook. And, and he, he called me up because he wanted tetracyclines to modify the TED on, TED off switch that I was working on with Herman Bijard. And I said, well, you're a neurologist. My pharmacologist can't get the stroke model to work. Could you jump in? And so he jumped in and he got compounds to work, tetracyclines that were neuroprotective interventions. And we got funded by the Department of Defense for three or four years. And we did all kinds of great studies. But you know about stroke. You know about ischemia reperfusion out there. There's not a lot of uh, therapeutic options. You're kind of on your own, really. You know, they have Activase, and then maybe they'll throw in a steroid or a neurological drug or something just to, because there's no drugs. There, there's no cure for it, okay? And so, you know, we need new therapies. And so when I started studying all this, Mark brought up the fact that, that he's a neutrophil scientist. He studies how they're primed in the lung and how they rush up to your brain and cause further damage. We started studying these circulating neutrophils and we started synthesizing compounds directed to these neutrophils. And we found that we could uh, create a damaging immune cell and call them any acronym you want. But in this case, our compounds took these uh, uh, activated neutrophils and they turned them into non-toxic neutrophils. And let me show you some data because I just love it because uh, the, this hasn't been done before. In this case, uh, our compounds lowered TNF alpha production. They also changed the polarization of these neutrophils and they, they deactivated CD11B, which is kind of an interesting because now we're changing the phenotype and then they decreased the free radicals. And so we, so we built this cascade to test our 80 or so compounds that came out of this grant. And we found after we got them in the animals that they inhibit neutrophil dependent brain injury. So here on the left, you see what happens when you have a stroke, okay? And this is through the three vessel, three VO model. <laughs> this white line shows you where the yellow, or I'm sorry, the green neutrophils, the toxic neutrophils all misshapen get in and start destroying the tissue. Whereas with our drug, they get in, but they don't destroy the tissue. So they're still chemotactic, but they don't cause the damage. And so we formed M3 Therapeutics in the last couple of years to raise money to bring these type of compounds into the clinic. And just to final show you what, what, what happens in a whole animal, which brain would you rather have? The one that has the occlusions with the red, or with M3T 2165. And this is dosed two hours after, after the, the event. So these molecules stop this activation and they also kind of stop the, the hemorrhagic form of stroke. And you know, there's more data to this. I don't want to bore you too much about it because where this is going is that these molecules inhibit uh, and inactivate um, damaging immune cells. And that's where we're going with that. So how does it work though? Because, you know, there's all these mechanisms of action and Dr. Chen pointed that out. And in our case, I wanted to study mitochondria because, well, nobody did it. And so uh, I was interested in viral infection induced hypoxia. And so there's all these areas that the tetracyclines can work at. And I tried to pick and choose where to go on this because these compounds have a broad utility in hypoxia rel related conditions, but I met Johan Auerks and Johan Auerks is at EPFL and he's the founder of MitoBridge and Sertris and all these other companies. And he's a mitochondria expert. And so basically what his theory is with doxycycline is that it can stimulate the unfolded protein response in mitochondria the signaling pathway between mitochondria and the cell. And that process where you stimulate that unfolded protein response is called mitohermesis. And it's kind of a new topic. 
And I, I, I invite you to look at it because, you know, mitochondria take up 25% of your cell. They, they're basically in charge of what's going on. And so everything from that energization state, that signaling state is, is, is downstream, whether it's MMP expression or cytokine storms or everything else, it's based on the mitochondrial frenzy, I call it. So in our case, when I met him, he has this, uh, I can skip through this one. He basically takes, took our compounds and passed them through a screen. And what we saw in, in, in the worm model, Canorhabditis elegans, and this is one that uh, uh, details the unfolded protein response. And as we made derivatives around the ring, we saw that certain compounds activated this unfolded mitohermetic response, a favorable um, response by the mitochondria. Think of it as making the mitochondria uh, exercise chemically, okay? So in this case, the more glowing, the better. And so doxycycline, he had already described that, but as we walked around the ring system and, and at all these different positions, we saw differences in activity. And the interesting part is that they're not antibiotics. All these different position modifications up here, over here, it kills antibiotic activity. So basically what we're doing is we're targeting specifically the mitochondria with compounds that do not target um, um, escape pathogens. And that's what everybody worries about, antibiotic resistance. Um, I don't wanna go into antibiotic resistance because it's, it's a controversial topic. I'm not sure I'm really at, at home with it, uh, but I can tell you this, that um, as you modify molecules, and you know, I've made 3,000 derivatives of the tetracyclines, you see differences in activity in different uh, biological settings. And so in this case, our non-antibiotic tetracyclines, and we just published this paper, by the way, stimulated this mitochondrial stress response and this type 1 in interference interferon response in mammalian cells. And so that's got a big ramification because the further thing it does, and nobody expected this either, and we did this uh, at, at Johan's lab at EPFL, is that it changed the phenotype of different cells. And in this case right here, it corrected ciliopathies in, in, in lung cells and it boosted lung regeneration. We had never seen that before with tetracyclines. And so that's good. So what do you do with it? So we put it into an animal model of influenza. And by the way, we started this in 2000, just as COVID was coming out. And the, these studies were done in Wuhan, China, at Wuxi Aptek, by the way. And what we did was, uh, by the way, great scientists, you know, it, it really is like a, a, the research capital of China. And what they did for us was test our compounds and we could prevent uh, um, death and, as well as uh, increase uh, favorable clinical stores, giving our compound. And our compound was about tenfold more potent than doxycycline. And so now we have a compound that's not antibacterial and affects this survival on preventative administration as well as therapeutic administration. And so this was done, you know, these, these animals were dosed after they were infected with the, um, uh, the, the H1N1 virus. Now, you probably ask, well, does it affect the, the virus uh, itself? And the answer is no, we tested that. And then we also studied, uh, um, the, the reviewers of the paper said, well, what, how does it affect the microbiome? Well, I've already tested this 17 times, but we did another study and I could go into it, but basically this molecule doesn't touch the internal microbiome. So it's a non-antibacterial uh, compound. Uh, these other diseases for our compounds, where could they go? Uh, we're studying these two in red, neurodegenerative disease and ischemia reperfusion industry and, and kidney. That's where we're going with it. And uh, I just want to talk about Alzheimer's disease because the tetracyclines have a rich history of affecting Alzheimer's patients. And so we're studying it now. Basically, our compound um, restores functioning of uh, in this AD worm model. So that's in the worms, okay? And so basically these worms are able uh, to, 
to get back to their normal performance with our compound as well as with doxycycline. And so there's something going on on a molecular level. And right now we're studying these compounds in the FAD mouse model and the latency of the platform is improved uh, over the wild type. And if you look at the latency to platform, you see that when an animal develops uh, Alzheimer's, it takes about 60 seconds for him to get to the platform, whereas with our drug, it goes back down to about 10, uh, 10 seconds. And then finally, you know, we're studying these compounds in the same model, but we're studying EEG abnormalities with our compounds. And we're seeing that the lower frequencies are coming back almost like wild type. Now, I don't know what it means. You know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, work still going on. And the EEG story is kind of interesting to me. And, uh, you know, here's what I've been looking at for my whole career. You know, we already got the, the antibiotics. I say leave minocycline to the antibiotic people, by the way, because it's not good for long-term use. I don't want to go into that. Uh, I've looked at efluxin, which transgenics. I've looked at malaria, parasites. There's similarities between parasites and what happens uh, with the compounds and neuroinflammation. And so that's where I'm at now. And because of Nikki and Brian Balin, I am so interested in intracellular pathogens. I call them neuropathogens or cryptopathogens. And I'm interested in the rickettsias and uh, my, uh, chlamydia and uh, selectively targeting them too. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we're making new compounds. We're uh, uh, hopefully going to get them into the clinic. And uh, it's a long story, but you know, as I said earlier, tetracyclines weren't really, excuse me, antibiotics weren't really uh, uh, discovered and related to the to the society by Alexander Fleming. Actually, they were they were found two thousand years earlier by a uh, a tribe in Nubia, and this fellow George Armalagus. All right, uh, who passed away recently, by the way, was studying these and he saw these osteons in there and he said, hey, Mark, can you can, can you analyze these? And I said, oh, I don't know, George. So I basically dissolved them in an anhydrous HF. And what we found was that uh, we found that these ancient tribes were fermenting tetracyclines and they were found in high amounts. And so let, just let it know that, that it's good to shake things up. And that's why I like... Uh, uh, the intracell research group, because they're shaking things up when it comes to intracellular uh, problems and neurodegeneration. So ancient Nubians made antibiotic beer. And, uh, and, and, and so what can you do for your brain health? Well, let me tell you, I was telling you about Johan Auerks, and uh, he's an EPFL, and he's holding a pomegranate, okay? And by the way, I love molecules, not just tetracyclines. But you see, at, he discovered that urolithin A, a natural product from, from this pomegranate family, um, has a similar mechanism of action as do the tetracyclines. So until I get a drug on the market, all I can say is eat some pomegranates, but there's other polyketides in nature. And uh, the previous fellow pointed out the cannabinoids, and I'm sorry I didn't throw that up there for you, but they too are polyketides and they're anti-inflammatory as well, you know. So all these different molecules can stimulate uh, uh, mitohermesis. And uh, finally, uh, just a, a shameless plug, I'm trying to start the Amazonic chemistry at CP Lab Chemicals. And I know a lot of you are looking for uh, research reagents and APIs and uh, contact me because uh, if we don't carry it, it doesn't exist. Any case, that's it. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you need any tetracyclines, you know, I, I, I actually keep a whole supply of them in my office because I'm always shipping them out to people. And uh, I have people studying them in, in longevity and, and a bunch of other stuff. But, you know, I could talk for hours on, on what they actually do and what they don't do. But um, I'm happy to send you some if you want to test them in a model. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark, for your talk. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments? I have a question um, yeah. on the uh, on this tetracycline that um, has um, basically dampening the um, 
the uh, neuroinflammatory effect of uh, neutrophils. Right. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you, if you got into the, the 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 genetics or the biology or what what it does, but I'm wondering if you if LCN two uh, rings a bell for you, the protein L uh, LCN two. No, it's but I'd be happy. it's a neutrophil gelatinase, and it's expressed in in neutrophils, um, and we do see it in in ischemia, so in stroke, and we do see it in vascular uh, AD. And um, and we actually are working on to uh, designing a uh, an anti LCN two drug and maybe your tetracycline this is what it does. <laughs> I would like to to discuss this. Maybe look into this brains. You know, sure. you know, uh, LCN two. I'd have to get Mark Halterman involved with this or Johan. I'm sure yeah. Johan does uh, RNA seq day in and day out. Um, he's never brought it up, but it wouldn't surprise me because again. Is, is LCN2 a calcium dependent or a metal dependent um, um, target protein? So um, it's basically a sequestering uh, iron, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll look into it. If you're working with it, I could throw some compounds at you and I'd be happy to see what happens. <laughs> yes. Right? Uh, it's know? interesting because we see it uh, specifically in. Uh, in stroke, so that's your model basically, hmm. um, and we see it in vascular dementia, and we see it in uh, vascular AD type, and we see it actually after uh, prolonged uh, chronic inflammation in the mouse model, where there is really this this uh, LCN two um, uh, spike uh, that perdures, and it seems that it really uh, potentiates neuroinflammation. Sure. Hey, you never know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, no. so no. yeah. Well, let's talk offline. Yeah, I I think it's it's really amazing work, and uh, this is really truly novel for me because uh, of course uh, we from the uh, neurology side we are very focused on mechanism and, and proteins, and uh, we rarely think that um, uh, you know from the uh, prokaryote side there would be, there would be a uh, some. some some drugs, but I, I totally fascinating and, and fascinating also the data you're getting uh, with this, this new compound, which uh, probably um, yeah, it's, it's offer, offers a, a lot of thoughts about uh, mitro mitochondrial function and how tetracycline are working towards mitochondrial dysfunction. Yeah, you know, it's almost like there's a tetracycline, you know, I've studied these, you know, thousands of molecules in, in tens, if not hundreds of assays, and you start to see different targeting effects. Like, for instance, it would be nice to target specifically Lyme disease and wipe that out because there hasn't been a new, you know, doxy is the best anti-Lyme drug, but yet nobody's come out with a new one. And uh, Nuzira doesn't work that well against it. And um, I wouldn't use minocycline long-term anyway, because it forms uh, dark pigmentation of metabolically active tissues. So, you know, molecules have problems. So you try to design around it. And one, one, uh, one question is uh, in terms of secondary effects, um, do you see any secondary effects uh, if those uh, drugs would be used on the long-term by, by patients? Um, well, you know, you don't want to be on a drug forever, but some drugs act, you know, here's the thing. People, two decades ago, when I was watching all the all these biologists work on it, every time they increased the dose, it, things got worse. And, you know, normally you think, well, antibiotics will work better. Well, when it comes to mammalian diseases and neuroinflammation, uh, when we cut back on the dose, they got better. So, you know, it's not always the advantageous to increase a dose so small amounts of compound versus large amounts yeah anyway it's complex okay Nikki. thank you guys mark thank you so much for the excellent presentation and also for the shout out um so much of it speaks to me and i probably have a lot of questions that i can hit you with offline too um like namely how did they make that beer no i'm just kidding um but what I wanted to know was, um, I was looking, first of all, at your list of diseases that are being investigated, I'll say, with minocycline. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm super fascinated by the list because I read tangentially so many of those diseases have been associated with infectious processes. For example, schizophrenia and uh, Bartonella infection, particularly Bartonella hensley, which is uh, susceptible or at least um, uh, there, there can be resistance issues with Bartonella with, with any single antibiotic. Um, so, you know, can end up needing multiple antibiotics to treat and typically Lyme literate doctors end up treating patients that have Bartonella infections. But one thing I was curious about um, was with your non-antibiotic molecule, which you checked for any kind of microbiome disturbances or antiviral activity in your influenza work. Did you happen to see if it had any impact on intracellular bacteria? Did you look at any of those obligate no. No, no we curious. didn't get that close. Uh -uh. I was just curious. You know, I was just trying to, you know, uh, trying to swage a reviewer. So we had to go do all those stuff. <laughs> I'll be honest. Yeah, no, that, that know, was I just mean, a... theoretically, yeah, theoretically, you know, they should work because, you know, years ago, they're like, oh, tetracyclines don't even, don't get into mammalian cells. Well, that was proven yeah. wrong. And so, you know, basically your immune cells act as, as conduits and carry intracellular pathogens all over your body while they're engulfing them. And so right. then, and then if they don't, if they don't, if they don't get cleared, they're, 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 they're disseminated throughout your body. So there's a lot going on and I wish people would just, I, I hope that people study these phenomena. So one more thing I wanted to say to you, Mark, was that um, Dr. Rob Howard in the UK did do a prospective trial that you and I have talked about, I think, um, with minocycline and Alzheimer's disease. And they tested it at two doses. It was 100 milligrams BID and 200 milligrams BID of minocycline. And they didn't see any impact on cognitive scores. I believe it was two years, um, 24 months. That's that's particular study. But there were different concepts that were discussed around potential reasons why there may not have been benefit. Um, some of them being namely that, um, you know, issues around uh, patient selection, right? Like if, if you're actually, first of all, if you're looking at it from an antimicrobial perspective, you kind of want to know what you're treating uh, before you treat it. And that's kind of a hallmark, a hallmark, right? Of an ID doctor's job is to know what they're treating before they treat the patient. But then did you have any thoughts on, you know, why mino may not be apart from its long-term issues that it has um, that you raised, why it, it may have not had impact in, in AD by itself at those doses? Yeah. Well, again, you know, uh, PGP proteins and transporters in the blood brain barrier and age and leakiness and, you know, what is it you're really... Um, what, are you, what is it you're really dosing with? And, and is it getting to the site? Did they do CSF analysis? Did they determine how much actually got in in these patients? You know, so um, clinical trials are tough. And so, yeah. you know, yeah, no, the blood-brain barrier. Do, they didn't yeah. do all of that, to your point. That wasn't right. done. So. No. I mean, I don't know the specifics, but I can tell you that, again, you don't need to beat up the patient with, with drugs sometimes, you know, uh, neurodegeneration is a long-term prospect. And so maybe you got to lower the dose. I don't know. Um, that's what, I, that's what we saw in animals. Okay. Lower the dose, they got better. Uh, higher the dose, well, there's toxicities, you know, molecules are not sacrosanct or sa it's safe at higher concentration. So. Okay. Uh, Brian. Yes. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, Obviously, I find this very fascinating, but I, I have uh, two questions. One is whether or not um, you've done any studies with using the tetracyclines that have antibiotic activity in addition to the ones without the, your, your derivatives without antibiotic activity, if you could use them together. And the other question is about the intercalation of the fibrillar forms of a lot of these molecules that are developing and accumulating in these neurodegenerative diseases. And I ask that because in, in culture, tetracyclines were used to uh, inhibit the ability of amyloid fibrils to form by through intercalation events. Mm. Uh, so what are your thoughts on those, those questions? Sure. Um, 
You know, it, the intercalation properties, the, the ability to bind calcium magnesium is important. You know, uh, neural dysfunction occurs when, when, when calcium dynamics goes out the window. And so the tetracyclines can restore those because they inhibit uniporters and a bunch of other stuff in mitochondria. And so that's part of the whole equation. That's why it's still a black box. You know, when I talk to Johan and these mitochondria folks, they're like, well, it stimulates uh, um, um, these, these mitochondrial stress responses and, and other molecules that stimulate them end up in apoptosis and detrimental states, okay? But the, with the tetracyclines can stimulate the same processes, but they don't cause apoptosis. And why is that? Well, because, they're, because calcium dynamics during the apoptotic state uh, go, go awry. And so in this case, the tetracyclines can stop that secondary pathway. There may even be a tertiary or quaternary, who knows? You know, uh, people think that they can just treat one. First off, by the way, all drugs don't act only at one site, okay? Um, I, I will fight that to the death because I studied molecular pharmacology as a medicinal chemist. But the fact is the tetracyclines being pleiotropic are modifying multiple detrimental pathways, whether it be calcium flux or stimulating small amounts of interferon uh, to, to make the mitochondria healthier and mitohermetic. So gosh, there's a lot we don't know, Brian. There really is. But you know, mm -hmm. with, with studying lots of molecules, you start to see trends. And the trend is, is that uh, someday we're gonna come up with a tetracycline that's gonna work the way we want it. Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. Uh, Professor Minzer, please. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, my comment is regarding the uh, tetracyclines and the um, and the uh, comment that Nikki said that uh, was not positive. And I would like to raise the attention that <laughs> the the level of impairment that the patient may have is important not only for to see a difference or a change, but more important for the crossing of the blood-brain barrier. I would like to refer you to the work of Michal Schwartz at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, where she showed <clears throat> that as, as the disease progresses, the permeability of the plexus choroideus becomes more viable, especially for big molecules. So, if you have a patient and you treat him with a tetracycline that will have difficulties going to a blood-brain barrier that is either mildly impaired or younger, uh, may not, may be quite different that the effect that you will get with somebody that is more impaired, not only because you, you the, the more impaired you are, the more you have to gain, but also, and more important, is because the molecules may have a better chance to get to the brain. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, as you age, things change. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Robert Moore out of MGH, you know, who pushed his theory of antimicrobial peptides, uh, I sat with him a couple summers ago pre-COVID because I wanted him and Rudy Tanzi to study my molecules. And Rob Moore was so excited. And he spent four hours telling me about how different bacteria cross the blood-brain barrier as you age. And the, the, the interesting part is that I'm sure molecules change as you age too. So, it, it, you know, you get leakiness. It's just a fact of life. Anyway, uh, he passed away from glioblastoma a month later. And so we never got to do that project. But I'd love to, to be able to study these things um, thoroughly because, um, well, it's a family of molecules that's been around for 75 years. And so why not? Dr. Mincer, the point you made is one that I appreciate because it echoes the sentiments of a, another group of colleagues that wrote a paper a few years ago, a very nice comprehensive review um, entitled Time to Test Antibacterial Therapy in Alzheimer's Disease, in which they discussed this issue of the permeability of the blood-brain barrier and the possibility of treating patients that are more um, moderate to severe versus treating earlier patients. So um, I do appreciate you raising that. Lavinia. That's, that's a good one. I think into the end of uh, pleiotropic functions, um, I mean, those are welcome, right? Because we have so many targets in the end. It's a truly a multivariate uh, 
disease, very dynamic. And uh, we think, of course, uh, uh, low-grade in inflammation caused probably by, by infectious agent could lead eventually to uh, late uh, stage uh, onset of Alzheimer. But um, yeah, maybe we can start a discussion. We went a little bit overboard on your <laughs> on your interesting uh, talk on tetracycline, very very new concept, and maybe we can start a panel discussion where we we go and 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 and, and through the the talks. And uh, uh, I personally think that we need so much more in this field and from different angles and and also multiple multiple mechanism and. Uh, um, I, I think that also the, the work of Professor Chang is uh, quite remarkable. How, um, but we have uh, also a question from uh, the audience. Uh, several of you um, mentioned mitochondria. Anyone can say anything about keto diet as an alternative energy source? So I'm just reading the question. So uh, you know. I... I do a lot of technologies and I've had the keto contingent come, you know, come to me and say, what do you think? Because I do a lot of VCs and everything and, and trying to raise money. And they're always asking me about the keto and, you know, I, I don't think it's a good idea to mess around with ketogenics. Okay. Ketogenic diets. Um, first off, they're horrible tasting and, but the main thing is, is that you don't know what you're doing on a biochemical level. And I think already we're starting to see stories come out in, in as, as antidotes or actually in the, in the scientific literature that ketogenic diets can be dangerous. Um, I, I, I don't know, fad things, I, FAD and NAD and all, all these different longevity people. Um, I have a problem with it, all right? Because it's, it's, it's consumer chemistry that's, that's kind of like, unregulated. Oh, you're on. Maybe someone else wants to comment on this from the speaker. Maybe Professor Cheng has uh, some evidence for lifestyle oh. interventions. Yeah, I, I, I can try to touch a little bit, but uh, we, we don't do mitochondria kind of stuff. So, you know, just for this particular diet, I, I don't think this is just the alternative auto, approach. This is really dependent on the individuals, right? You know, you know, for, for this kind of idea. So we also do like a more like a gut metabolize or, you know, gut, you know, microbone study to see how the diet, you know, associated with the AD risk, how prevalent. So I would not just really suggest we can, you know, use this ketone diet, right, to prevent, you know, you know, Alzheimer's. This really depends on the individuals and you need to, you know, you know, how to say, communicate with your physicians depending on what you, you know, your comorbidities or something like that, you know. I, I, I would not, I, I agree with the Mark, you know, suggestion, so. You're mute. Uh, you are muted, Lavinia. Um, if Professor Minzer wants to comment on this, or we just move on to, to the next topic. He's not on okay. Sorry, uh, sorry yeah. I'm here. Uh, technology is not my friend, as usual. Uh, <laughs> what was the question? Um, well, it was, it was, the question was whether lifestyle intervention would work at all considered. Um, because we are, we have looked at a lot of mitochondrial dysfunction, and apparently there is someone asking whether a keto diet was uh, considered as an alternative energy source. I have nothing to contribute to this. You think? <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so I think the, um, this was was really wonderful because we we looked at really um, novel mechanism. Uh, at the end stage of the life of those patients, uh, going through really the uh, um, really risk factors, and uh, as a, as a Professor Chang identified, there are some articles already out there that could be used, uh, maybe 
um, other uh, vascular agents could be very useful uh, for for the the prevention of of Alzheimer. Um, and then, of course, uh, the tetracycline uh, story, very fascinating as a multi uh, and, and pleiotropic um, mechanism of actions. Uh, so I, I think that there is much more um, to to do at this point. When we had, um, you know, we we all started uh, thinking about this, this symposium when when there was a lot of uh, ups and downs. I mean, there were first the ups about the aducanumab, and then uh, of course the, the FDA did not uh, approve it. Then of course there was also was reconsidered uh, by the FDA. Um, and, and again, there's a lot of talks about uh, vaccination and it seems that now neuroinflammation is a topic, um, but there is much more to it, really understanding uh, as, as also uh, Brian, uh, was uh, was mentioning understanding really the uh, evolution of the disease uh, when it starts and of course uh, digital biomarkers if they, if they come at hand and are able to distinguish between um, phenotypes um, that that would be great and it would be probably great for you uh, Professor Cheng to partner with with them if you're talking about in the phenotype to see whether your the results of your of your study um in terms of of, of this very um high level uh, omics data uh, could then be captured in uh, you know digital biomarker that could could serve as a sentinel for for then referring to uh to 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 a doctor because sometimes it's it's it, wow. I mean, in the end i'm i don't know if if it will be this way but um, as the disease is so so long in its asymptomatic phase, and we know that there is so many mechanisms ongoing at that particular stage, probably we will let um, patients or future patients get a hold of their health <laughs> uh, before going to the doctor. Yes, Professor Mincer? I just need to leave because I have a yeah, patient sure. outside. No problem. But, uh, I thank would so like much. to thank everybody for the opportunity to be yeah. here and talk with all these smart people. Yeah, thanks thank a lot. You, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mincer. Yeah, so um, I don't know if we want to, to add anything more about the discussion. Uh... I think what every talk was very interesting and i don't know if it's possible but it would be nice to write a kind of report about yeah, today's sure. today's topics i don't know yeah Just we can to, uh, we can try to uh, to do that uh, it was a little bit uh, biased at the beginning uh, towards the the infectious or or uh, um, chronic inflammation hypothesis of the disease and i and i'm sorry for that it, <laughs> But we we are very keen on on this uh, on this mechanism. We are we, we think there is a lot of truth and uh, and there is a, a lot of potential for repurposing also. And I think that uh, of course the pharma company don't don't like as much repurposing. Um, and we need to learn, of course, from from cancer research where there is uh, a lot more going on and a lot more of the, of trials. Uh, we, I was just was just looking. I mean, for for Switzerland per se, it's it's not a, it's not a good uh, place to do any comparison because uh, the the proportion of, of 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 funding for cancer is forty times the one of Alzheimer in Switzerland. So it's uh, it's it's really dismal. Um, but certainly, uh, cancer. I mean, the 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 um, kind of the, the excellence, but also this, this investigational uh, aspect uh, rather than really driven by the evidence to, 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 of, of research um, should be a little bit more prominent. I think we, the field in general has been um, very slow. Um, I think clinical evidence uh, has been really dominating, and we know that clinical evidence, unfortunately, uh, is is very late. Um, so, so whatever allows us to to go early on and being able to even do uh, endophenotypes, uh, which are of course accessible uh, through blood or or through a, a certain type of sequencing, would be a very um, 
desirable. I think any diagnosis is better than, than no diagnosis, especially for, uh, for the relatives because it's easier to plan, but even for, for the new generation of, of patients that I, I think are, are, are closer to, 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 to understanding the concept of, of brain aging and brain health. Um, and so um, I think if we don't have any more question, I think every talk was fantastic. I, I really want to thank everyone. Uh, Manu, if you want to 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 elaborate on anything, uh, I mean, was happy to to be to be part of this symposium and listen to all these talks. Many of the, of the subjects were new to me, so tetracycline is a new word. Now we we'll read something about, and then also yeah other topics about uh, the use of THC and CBD. I read something, but uh, now Professor Minzer, let's say, transmitted some more interest about it, and also Professor Cheng was really inspiring, and he showed many many things that are ongoing in his lab, but I mean in in many studies around the world. So yeah. I'm happy to, I learned something new. So thank you to everyone of you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you for organizing nice. that. You yeah, know. it was really, so um, I just want to end maybe earlier, slightly earlier on, uh, just uh, by uh, presenting the, the last slide I had, um, which is hopefully, uh, now I can share it. Uh, do you want, I will, I will stop your, uh, your screen, uh, Dr. Nelson, if oh, it's okay. Yep, sorry. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. Um, um, yeah. So we talked about, um, a lot of exciting data, but we have actually decades of failures. Uh, I think, uh, Professor Cheng mentioned 99.6% uh, of, of, uh, clinical trial fail. This is not a good um, a good record, uh, especially for for a field that needs more investment, um, and this has, has created a lot of vulnerability and volatility in the market. Um, I think there is a lot of more uh, research, and we need really to focus on evidence based uh, research on mechanism of action that will really give insight onto the pathogenesis of ID and, and drive the next generation of, of therapeutics. Um, and this was really what we, I wanted to convey with this, uh, um, this symposium. I think we, we got there and uh, I want to, to thank um, uh, Radhika Pat um, Patala. She has provided all the beautiful backgrounds uh, from that I asked the speaker to, uh, uh, to pin on their virtual background. Uh, and of course, Nikki from Intersor Research Group. I, I'm really looking forward to the next step with with their um, with this with this uh, active uh, group of people uh, of researcher to bring forward the concept of the infectious hypothesis of AD. And I want to thank also the Innovation Agency of Switzerland that thought that this would be something worthwhile pursuing uh, in terms of uh, creating novel technologies and and novel. Um, inspiration for for investment. Uh, we the we will post uh, the symposium uh, on YouTube, and we do have a, a LinkedIn channel and also a Twitter channel. Uh, I'll try to uh, post a YouTube video uh, as soon as possible, so you have access to it. Of course, I will send you all the. Um, the material so you are able to then uh, distribute it if you need it uh, with uh, or if you want it to to with your community and uh, i of course want to thank really all the speakers fantastic talks and really a lot of uh, uh, food for thoughts at this time great thank you all thank thanks you. a lot everyone thank you thank you, thank you. Thank bye bye you. Thank you. bye bye Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.